Pessoal, boa tarde a todos. Sejam bem-vindos a mais um dia de atividades do oitavo simpósio de plantas medicinais do Vale do São Francisco e do segundo France Brasil Meeting on Natural Products. Então, vamos dar início à sessão de hoje, né, o nosso terceiro dia. Vamos iniciar com a palestra do Dr. Sérgio Ortiz, que é da Universidade de Estrasburgo, na França. E eu vou fazer aqui a leitura né, de um currículo resumido aqui do Sérgio. Ele é químico pela Universidade Católica do Norte, no Chile, é mestrado em ciências, em sais do medicamento, é, pela Université Paris Descartes, na França, e doutorado em farmacognosia pela mesma universidade. Realizou estágio pós-doutoral na Université Paul Sabatier, em Toulouse, também na França, e também pela Université Católica de Louvain, na Bélgica. E atualmente é professor pesquisador na Universidade de Estrasburgo, na França, atuando na área de farmacognosia. Então, desde já, agradecemos ao professor Sérgio pelo aceite, ao nosso convite, por estar também abrilhantando o nosso evento. É, seja bem-vindo, Sérgio. Fique à vontade para... Thanks so much. Obrigado. Thanks so much. Obrigado por the invitation. And for the nice uh, presentation and introduction. So we'll share my screen. Oh. Sorry. Can you see the screen well? Yes, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay? Okay. okay. So, boa tarde. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity uh, to speak to you today and to try to explain a little bit of my uh, scientific work that I started from my PhD. Um, as mentioned before, uh, today I will um, make a talk uh, titled Exploring the Traditional Medicine of uh, Licanantai People from North of Chile as an in inestimable source of bioactive compounds. Uh, this, is, this is a collaborative um, holistic project between one Licanantai community from the North of Chile and several uh, research institutes in France. But before to explain the project and the main results, I would like to explain the motivation behind this project. And for that, I need to talk about some uh, not very happy stories in, uh, in Chile. It's about the context of the, the last uh, centuries and the actual context of different ethnic cultures from Chile that as we can see, we will see some example uh, in this presentation, is a story of extermination. As uh, we know in South America before the, the European uh, people arrived, there were several culture, different cultures in all the continent. Uh, one of them was uh, the Segna uh, people present in the land of fire in the south of Chile now shared between Chile and Argentina. Uh, this uh, group of people were uh, mostly uh, hunting, uh, semi-nomad lifestyle, uh, and they were living in the land of uh, fire, Tierra del Fuego in Spanish, uh, for almost in the last of the uh, 19th century. Until one point that uh, the Chilean government decided that this land was very fertile for cattle and farming some uh, goats and sheep. Um, they started to make this farming in the, in the same land of the Selman people. The problem was that for the Selman people, they didn't have the uh, private property concept. So when they saw some uh, uh, food or new sources in the nature, they decided to share with all the people. So that time when the people, when the government, uh, Chilean government start to make some uh, farming for cattle or for sheep, for example, they start to hunt in this sheep. 
obviously that was a big problem. Uh, so the answer of the Chilean government at the time, they decided to exterminate, to liberate the land from the from the Segna. Uh, so that was uh, the, the the answer for the Chilean government, and that resulted that from the beginning of 3,000 Segna people that were censed in the 80s, in the 18, 18 years, they passed only, only to 100 at the 1910 year. That is a gap of only 30 years. The last Segna alive, uh, this person died in uh, 1974. Uh, the point is uh, we lost all the culture, all the cosmovision, all the tradition, all the society point of view, because we saw that uh, we, we think that the Segnam people was a matriarchy uh, people. Um, and we lose all the culture, even now, for example, the traditional medicine that uh, is the one topic that is interesting for the, uh, for the audience uh, today. So here we can see some photos and also mentioned as a Franco-Brazilian uh, symposium. Uh, some examples also from Paris in the years 1887. Uh, Segma people also were exhibited at the Somme Human Zoo. We don't have, we don't have, uh, we don't must forget the existence of this Human Zoo. Uh, there were in the in the Europe before the First uh, World War. Uh, other case was the Cahuescar people. Now they're living also in the south of, the, of Chile. These have also more a uh, nomad li lifestyle. They li live between the, the small fjords and rivers in the south of Chile. Uh, but in that case, it was almost the same case that in the for um, Segan people. So the government of Chile tried to explode the land for commercial purpose. Uh, but in that case, they decided to Re, uh, to move all the people to some island in order to re-educate them as Chilean people. But uh, in practice, it's, this was just a concentration camp for Kawaskar people. They were in very insalubrate condition that uh, and that uh, uh, results in the almost also extermination in a few years for all the Kawaskar people. The last P uh, Kawaskar people alive died in 2003. And we arrived to the same point. We lose all the culture, the cosmovision, the tradition, the language, and also all the information relative to the traditional medicine. So with this background, um, we decide to try, not, not to try to, that this story doesn't repeat, but we as scientific, we have some cards to play in these cases. In this, um, this is the case for the Atacama people, the Atacama people, that is the English name, Atacameños, this is the Spanish name for this uh, culture, or also Licanantai, that they are their Kunsa name, the Kunsa is the language of Licanantai people. In this case, the Atacama people, they live in the north of Chile, near also with uh, Argentina in some part of Bolivia. Uh, but they didn't, didn't have the same destiny that Kawaskar and Segma, for example. Why? Because in that time, uh, these lands that we will see in, the, in, the, in a few next slides, this land in the, and that time didn't have a lot of commercial uh, potential. So the government of Chile, or well, no all private societies or nothing more like that, uh, didn't have interests interested in the land. So they are relative, very uh, isolated from the Chilean community, um, Chilean uh, uh, communities. Uh, they didn't have a lot of mix between the Chilean people and the Atacama people. So their culture, the um, the society is, is still until now, until nowadays very well preserved. Also, we have to mention the, uh, the extreme environmental condition that these people live. That Atacama people, the Licanantai, that I say they live in the north of Chile, 
and we have not forget in the north of Chile, we have the driest desert in the world. They live in a very high altitude between 3,000 and 4,500 meters of altitude. So the, the disponibility of oxygen is not very high. They also experimental, uh, the, the region experimental a very high variation of temperature during the night that the, we can arrive to minus 10 uh, Celsius, Celsius degrees. And during the day, we arrive also to 30 Celsius degrees. And also other thing very important is the UV radiation that we have almost all the year in this region is more than 12. That is the, the higher uh, level of UV radiation. So they have still the, the culture well preserved. They live in a very high extreme environmental condition, but also uh, this region that we can maybe think that is not very um, very great in, in biodiversity is the contrary. It presents very uh, very great bio, uh, sorry biodiversity in. Um, in um, for plants, for example, we can find a lot of different plant species from different uh, uh, families. But by the contrary, the biodisponibility, that's been the quantity, of the uh, the space, the the plants, the I don't know, uh, the kilo of plants, we, they are not very very extensive. That uh, also they are very difficult to access access to this the the, um, the small valleys where the plants are present uh, the other point also that motivates also for to create this uh, this project this collaborative project is the um, the well preserved of, of the ethnobotany of the Likanantai people in fact the ethnobotanic the, the traditional medicine is already very well documented the community of Likanantai they still use a lot of the uh, this traditional medicine but also the Chilean people in the in the big cities in the north of Chile for example Kiko and Tofagasta they start to use also this traditional medicine but the point is there are not very large studies that validate the traditional use of the of these plants or even some phytochemical studies of the plants neither. So we have there one a big lack of knowledge that we wanted to try to fill. So with this background, we decided to, call, to create an holistic collaborative project with Tyra community, that is a Likan and Thai community that they call them uh, Tyra. Uh, but must be a collaborative project. That means that the, we, as a scientific in our laboratory, we have regular, regular meeting with the Taura community, just to explain the, the, new, the new result we will have been, uh, the direction of the project we was to decide to, to follow. Uh, also, the community is always asking for permission for new collaboration. For example, we, we are working in the pharmacognosy lab, so we don't have the access for, to all the tests of biological activity. So when we decide to make new agreement for collaboration, we must to pass first for the permission of the community. We cannot go and, uh, uh, and go to another lab of weight hydration and medicine. Uh, so we must respect also the volunteer of the community and also that was also surprising for us in the, during the project, the active participation of the community in the scientific discussion. Obviously, we will not discuss, for example, which kind of silica we will use for separation or which kind of uh, soil we will do, but to discuss about the, the purpose of the project, uh, for example, what we have, what we can do when we have a heat extract or a heat compound. Where, what does the follow the, the step to follow? Uh, this was very rich uh, uh, conversation and uh, and transmission of knowledge between the laboratory and the community of Tyra. But first of all, even before to start to collect the plants, we need to respect also the conventions subscribed by Chile, because this was a, the, uh, the traditional medicine cor correspond to the uh, bio source uh, from Chile. So we try to also respect the Nagoya protocol. We have all the papers to do that take 
some months also to to get uh, done but it's done that must be all always the first uh, uh, approach the first steps when we try to make this kind of a collaborative collaborative project so the project in this scheme is very well represented the collaborative project have mainly two objectives one is the validation of the traditional medicine and the second one is try to uh, valorize valorize the um, the traditional medicine trying to add more knowledge at the biological activity level and also to the uh, chemical composition level so the project is organized in this uh, in this scheme we start with the traditional medicine from the, the for the target community and with them we made the collection of plants that we decide to get uh, analyzed then all the plants get through the same extraction procedure and then for all the extract the extract obtained we try to evaluate the more uh, to realize the more kind of screening that is possible and here in the framework of this presentation we i will always uh, only present the result what that we have in the for the antibacterial screening and also for the antiparasitic activity but there were a lot of more activity to what we decide to um, apply for all the extract. In each case, the more active extract of the screening was selected in order to apply bio-guided isolation uh, approach in order to isolate and identify the, um, the bioactive compound responsible of the activity of the extract. So as I said before, the first step was the field collection of the plants. There were two seasons, September uh, 2015 and 16, inside the Tyria community with the permission and the presence of the, pers of the people of the Tyria community. And in this case of a collection that result in the collection of 18 different plant species mainly from Astaraceae and Barmanaceae uh, family with different kind of uh, different kind of traditional use. In fact, these 18 plants, they were mainly, because the, we are now uh, talking about, again, symptoms, the plants, they're, they're mainly used against some symptoms that can, could be related for respiratory troubles, urinary infection or digestive disorders. Other plants, they were against symptoms that could be related with anti-inflammatory or pain disorders, and also some cases about uh, hair disorder against diabetes or other kind of uh, uh, illness. The next step now in the frame of my PhD in the laboratory of pharmacognosy in Paris, we proceed we proceed to the extraction procedure. Here we try to make different kind of extraction, either distillation to obtain some essential oil because related to the traditional uh, traditional medicine, the essential oil they use the essential oil of the plants, uh, but mainly some pressurized solid extraction in two different uh, consecutive in two different extracts in two different solvents, sorry, and also supercritical fluid extraction uh, um, with three level of co-solvent that allow us to obtain more than the 70, more, almost 78 extract, extract, different extra from the plants. And then all these extracts were applied in different screening. So the first screening that we will talk about today that we will have the more um, the more kind of uh, the, the more quantity of result is the antibacterial activity. This was in a collaboration with another laboratory from the Paris Descartes University, um, and we decided to evaluate the, the in vitro uh, antibacterial activity in some selected strain and to uh, for the more active extract um, uh, try to evaluate the minimal inhibitory concentration. 
And also, as, as I mentioned before, for the extract more active, we decide to a bio-guided approach in order to isolate the pure compounds responsible of the, uh, of the biological activity. Here's only one uh, slide to, ex uh, to explain our act active bacterial uh, in vitro methodology. In fact, we uh, solubilize the extract or the fraction or the pure compound with the, uh, ag with the liquid agar, and we uh, solidify both in the one uh, petri dish. So in that case, we have the extract present in all the petri dish. And, the, uh, and our approach only was to May, uh, to put one drop of uh, bacterial suspension uh, in the plates, and if after 24 hours, if the if the um, were bacterial colonical presence, uh, presence, that means the extract doesn't inhibit the the um, this is the strain. But if they were absent of the colony, that means the extract is active. So in this kind of uh, approach. That could be uh, that allow us to uh, evaluate more than fifty different strains at the same time. So that's why we we, uh, we wanted to to apply this methodology. But we need to use more quantity of extra. So there are there are more so more prone cons. So this is the screening only for the more active extract. Uh, in the screening, we found that for the, for example, for the no extra were active again gram negative strains. Um, so this MIC, um, the MIC value here are only for gram positive strains, some reference strain and other isolate from the hospital. So here we present the data of this, this um, minimal inhibitory concentration as a heat map. That means more green is the color. That means the minimal inventory concentration value is lower. For example, the more green is here is that represents some 0.5 to 2 microgram per milliliter. And here we have the uh, oflixacin, which is the uh, um, positive control. So just only regarding the colors, we can all uh, elucidate, um, select one extract is from Aloisa de Certicula that present big values between 10 and 60 microgram per milliliter. And other one, Crameria la Pasea, that presents big values between 5 and 40 microgram per milliliter. That's very, very, very active considering that they are uh, complex extracts. So with this result, we decide to make the biologic um, the bio guided isolation for the both uh, extract. For the case for Cameria la Pasea, we made the, the bio guided fractionation in an open column uh, fractionation, very classic. We tr we tested all the fraction, and from the more active fraction, we isolate neolignans. These kind of compounds, they are. They are not new. The structure is they are, they are already uh, published, but not the biological activity. The biological activity was new at the time. And here we can see that, for example, for conocarpan, this is the compound one. We found the big uh, mic values very very low between uh, two and zero point five microgram per milliliter in an order similar to uh, some uh, anti uh, commercial antibacterial uh, we can find in the market. So we were very happy to, to find this kind of result. And also for Alicia de Certicola, we decide to make also the bio guided uh, uh, isolation, uh, even if it wasn't the more active extract, but because for Alicia de Certicola is widely, widely used in the uh, lichen anti communities but also by the Chilean population uh, as to treat uh, some respiratory infection and also for urinary infection. So, so that's why we decide also to make to, to apply the bioactive, uh, the bioguided approach to isolate the responsible compound. In that case, we found some uh, treater pens that the activity is 
is, uh, is already very well known to be anti antibacterial for this kind of compound. The more active compounds was also ursulic acid that is incorporated with the uh, with the biological activity of triterpenes already published in the literature. In the literature. Here we didn't find very new information, but also is the first chemical study and antibacterial activity report of Alvisalia septicola that is widely used by the Chilean population. Also, as I mentioned before, that always we made that almost in, at the time two meetings with the community uh, per year. And when we um, explain this result of the antibacterial activity, they decide, they, they, they told us that uh, sometimes they, in the community, the community, they practice the traditional medicine, but also sometimes they also uh, take the modern medicine, uh, the occidental medicine at the same time. So with this information, we try to, to see, for example, if we can, uh, identify or evaluate some kind of uh, um, synergies between the traditional medicine and the modern medicine. So here we have this, the same plate that I mentioned before. Uh, um, we evaluated some combination. Here, for example, we can uh, see one, uh, one plate of the extract of Cramiria Lapace at five microgram per milliliter. So we can see here, for example, there are the presence of a lot of uh, colony bacteria. So that means at this, uh, uh, at this uh, concentration, the activity, the extra is not very active. And here we have another plate, but with the gentamicin, that is an antibiotic, at a very, very low concentration. And we saw also that uh, at this concentration, gentamicin is not very active. But when we made the plates for the extract and the antibiotic together at the same concentration, we saw that it's very highly active and this is a potential effect when the extract and the antibiotic are together. So we were very happy with this result, but it's still very qualitative, not very quantitative for results. So we decided then to calculate the fractional, fractional inhibitory concentration index that is an index that uh, try to evaluate the, the effect of one combination. If this combination is synergies, we must to have one kind of index of no interaction or even antagonism. In the case of antibacterial activity, we must to uh, evaluate the mid values alone and in the combination. So that's why then when we try to do the synergies, we found very high synergies no? for the uh, Cramiria la Passe extract that we identified that it was very active, but also presents some synergies no? with the um, gentamicin uh, antibiotics. And also for the conocarpan, that is the more active compound that we could isol uh, identify in our uh, bioguided isolation procedure. But that's one I want to explain also in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, uh, some problem that we have uh, sometimes the people that we decide to um, study the traditional medicine. For example, what happened with the inactive extract? And that's why I try to also put the holistic uh, word in my presentation. For example, uh, for the traditional medicine from uh, Likan and Thai, uh, we found for, uh, they told us, a lot of times that some plants, they are sure this for against infection. It's sure it's for, it is work for against the infection because it's, it's to treat fever and everything very related to infections. So this plant must be active in somehow. But when we made the, the extraction and the screening, it was inactive. That could explain a, a lot of things. For example, it wasn't a good part of the plant or it wasn't a good season to collect the plant, for example, or it wasn't a very good uh, extraction procedure to, to try to extract the, comp the active compound. But there's a lot of uh, points. But in this project, we try to go a little bit further, but in the field of the uh, biological screen that we can say. 
So that's why we would define, we, we, we decide to now evaluate if some extract could have the potential to reduce the virulence of some uh, bacterial pathogen. Not really directly antibacterial activity, but some kind of mechanism of action that they transform this, the pathogen less pathogen. And that could also explain the traditional use of the plants. In this case, we get in contact with one uh, laboratory in France that, especially from the, mecha the virulence mechanism of action of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a pathogen very, very known for all the audience. Um, this uh, laboratory was uh, is uh, specialized in the evaluation of new compounds in order to find some heat compounds to reduce the virulence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So they have a lot of kind of tests, a lot of kind of uh, um, screening and uh, biological approach in order to elucidate the probable mechanism of action, what kind of pathway they are uh, blocked and everything. So in that case, was the we uh, this is the laboratory, sorry, Rosita for Juan, uh, the Professor Sylvie Chevalier. Uh, and also we applied the screening against the pyosanin production by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In fact, this is a, this is a bacterial strain produced this kind of uh, pigment that is very, very toxic for the patient. So we try to see if some plants are um, are able to reduce the production of this uh, toxic compound. So that's why we found that from one plant, so Azorella tacamensis, uh, that it was very used against the respiratory infection, is able to reduce first the biosanin production of uh, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and also others mechanisms, uh, virulence mechanisms of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But as also in some uh, point for the, when we try, we work with traditional medicine, we also have one problem that we have a lot sometimes. I'm trying to say also this, uh, the virulence also was uh, upset, the reduce of the virulence of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa was also, Look, uh, was um, sorry, determinate in vitro and in vivo models, but for I think for for time I will pass the details. One big problem in this case was we didn't have enough quantity for biocide isolation, even if we have a very good activity of the extract. So we tried to have more quantity from Chile, but is the is the community what decide? No, we don't have more. We have just a few plants, we cannot give you more because if we give you these plants, we will not have for us. So in that case, also we have a big problem, but we decide to apply another approach is the replication of the constituents of the active extract by molecular networking. In fact, this kind of the replication strategy is uh, already well known for a lot of laboratory that we try to identify the biological, the um, the chemical constituent of uh, extract, for example, with no need of isolation. So that's why we try to analyze in a, with different techniques in order to arrive and propose putative structure for the chemical constituent of one extract. That's why we decided to make the replication by LC-MS-MS of the active extract from Azorella tacamensis. And we found that this extract is very rich in a lot of compounds, but mainly in diterpenes, diterpenoids. And also we went make a microfractionation and the evaluation of the fraction. We found that here we have the uh, chromatog chromatographic profile of all the fraction. The, um, the quantity of diterpenoid present of the fraction and also the piosanin production effect of the fraction. But here we can see that, for example, for the more active fraction, they are mainly constituent by diterpenoid. 
even that this is a very very good result that give you some uh, clue for to know which kind of uh, um, compounds are responsible of the biological activity we need to go further and try to elucidate the identify the pure compound responsible of the biological activity but this is a work that is actually ongoing Finally, I just some words about the antiparasitic activity that also made in different institute in, in cooperation in France and also in Greece. And only one to just to mention, we also evaluated the IC50 of uh, against different pathogen here also in a heat map uh, a representation for the more active uh, extract. For so the same thing, the more green. A color that means the IC50 is this the lower value, so more active. And we found one um, the same as Sorella Takamensis, also was very, very, very active against Plasmodium falciparum and with the IC50 of 1.3 microgram per milliliter. So, also we found the in this case, the deter, we confirmed the, 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 the case of the deter pen, uh, the presence of the deter pen. Here we could make the, the the bioguided isolation because this work was before that the uh, work about the uh, antivirulence activity. So in that case, we didn't have already some more material. But here we can find some uh, also some uh, determined structure, interestingly, with the endoperoxid uh, bond that also present in the artemisinin that we already know that is the for the use uh, as uh, anti-malarial compound. The biological activity is not very high, but uh, we were very happy to confirm the presence of the terpenoid and the, and the anti plasmodial activity of uh, this compound. So, in summary, for the antibacterial and antiparasitic potential of collected plants, uh, we found some key compounds that will could be uh, interesting to go further for the mechanism of action, for example. Uh, always with the community, for example, the guanocarpan against uh, gram-positive bacteria, diterpenoids with antivirulence activity, and also with an antiplasmodial activity. So I'd like to say again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, really. Uh, I'm here, uh, very excited to uh, hear uh, some questions for the audience. Thank you. Congratulations, Sergio, for your presentation, for the interesting work and very interesting. Mainly the, the part of the, the study of the, the replication using mm -hmm. the LCMS. Very good. Yeah. Pessoal, quem tiver pergunta, pode colocar aqui no chat, pode escrever em português, que a gente tenta traduzir aqui, se comunicar para que a gente possa ir conversando aqui com o Sérgio e tirar as dúvidas de vocês a respeito do trabalho. We have one, one comment from Professor Laurent Picot. Congrats, Professor Sérgio. This is an amazing work. <laughs> Julia, thank you so much. Bruna, congratulations, great presentation. I have one question, Sérgio. Yeah. <laughs> ah, aqui, aqui. The question of Raimundo. <laughs> have you yes, already... Uh, for the... Not yet, but it's, uh, it's a work that we... It's a project we will try now to get uh, established in uh, Strasbourg University because now we have some contacts that some uh, group that is they're open to to investigate this kind of uh, effect or mechanism of action. So I think we will try to first the the simple strategy I think is to try to evaluate the compound against some uh, um, well known uh, um, how to say uh, resistance bacteria that we know exactly which kind of resistance they have this, uh, this strain, then evaluate the, uh, 
the compounds. If, for example, these compounds lose the activity, so we can have some ideas of the already the mechanism of action. But if the compound is still active, that means maybe it's a new kind of uh, mechanism of action. Then we have to make some more uh, some collaboration with biological laboratories to try to now explore the the, the analysis of, of this compound in order to find the mechanism of action. But this is something uh, ongoing. Okay. Another question, Professor Luzia Kalini, Luzia Leal. Yeah, Leishmania, which I think was Leishmania Donovanni, Infantum, and Amazonensis. Nah, and okay. for the genetic patrimony, <laughs> uh, no, we didn't have problem. Yeah. Because in, in fact, uh, Chile has already signed Nagoya Protocol, but it wasn't ratified still so we have a, a long a big window to try to uh, uh, try to we can still work and we don't have this kind of uh, problem because uh, it's it's nothing wrong in, until now yeah okay my question is about the the study of the the replication yes update that the identification of the chemical compounds using the the replication using the GNTS after yeah. the analysis of the LCMS. If you have isolated this com these compounds, mm -hmm. for, uh, for example, for, yeah, yeah. For, yeah. for the antiplasmodial activity, we will already isolate two compounds and we applied it also in the um, not in the replication, but for the LCMS analysis, and we corroborate the presence of this compound that was also hit in the replication. And also the replication was made only one uh, small database, only with the compounds already isolated of the genus of the plant. So we also some chemiotaxonomy uh, data to make strong the, the, the replication. Okay. Yeah. But there are some determines they have the same exactly the same mass so it's difficult sometimes to to elicit which one is which one because uh, it's more yeah. uh, it's more difficult in that case the fragmentation is is very difficult for determines yeah. yes <laughs> for determines uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's not very clear sometimes and the problem is uh, now there are some tools that they, we can uh, uh, they replicate the fragmentation of one compound in silico ways because the fragmentation of some compounds they are not available in GMPS, for example. Did you use the electrospray ionization? Electrospray, yes. Electrospray. Uh, okay. Well, I think we tried to both. Uh, I think the replication was only negative, but also we made it positive or another kind of ionization. And the more informative <laughs> experimentation was when, uh, with electrospray in negative. Okay. Another question from Raimundo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I think for the diterpenoid that what they found is like the more than induced membrane disruption was that the, the compound block some of the receptor of the bacteria that uh, block how to say, block the capacity of the bacteria to answer to some stimulation. So it was to, to, to get down the, uh, to, to like uh, freeze the, the bacteria. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, uh, was to, to wait to block, for example, the kind of communication bacteria, the bacteria, bacteria communication, the bacteria colonization. So what's this kind of uh, mechanism of action that they found for, the, for this compound? Other uh, question. For the, yeah, for the endemic, uh, no. In fact, this kind, this species, they are not endemic from Chile, but they are uh, endemic from the region. The region is shared with Argentina and Bolivia, for example. So, this kind of plant we can find it also in in, in these countries. Send some of these molecules to Mr. Pico. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now, now that I'm in Strasbourg University, I also want to try to do this collaboration to continue. Uh, so yeah, why not? 
We okay. have to make some collaboration, yeah. Mais alguma pergunta, pessoal? Ainda temos quatro minutos aqui antes de encerrar a sessão. Uhum. Então, quem tiver alguma pergunta. Excelente apresentação. Professor Noreddin, is from Morocco. Really? I know, I know him. <laughs> yeah. Pronto, então acho que não temos mais perguntas. Thank you, Sérgio, again for your participation in our Obrigado, symposium. obrigado for the invitation. And, and I hope to see you soon. Uh, yeah, see you soon in here. France or <laughs> in Brazil. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Tchau. 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 Pronto, pessoal. Então, vamos dar sequência aqui à nossa é, atividade né, do dia. Então, agora vamos ter a palestra do doutor Hugo Grout, que é da Universidade de La Rochelle, na França. É, o doutor Hugo é engenheiro químico pela École Nationale de Chimie de Lille, na França. Doutor em Química Orgânica pela Universidade Complutense de Madrid, na Espanha, através do programa europeu Marie Curie. Atuou como pós-doc no laboratório Lian, em La Rochelle, na França, e atualmente é pesquisador efetivo do CNRS, Centro Nacional da Pesquisa Científica, na França, atuando no desenvolvimento de nanopartículas de ferro para aplicação terapêutica e diagnóstica em saúde. Então, vamos colocar aqui. Professor Dr. Hugo... Thank you for your uh, presence in our symposium. Feel free to start your presentation. Great. So, uh, songs do you hear me well? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I will Please share, to... share the presentation. Okay. Great. Ok. Is it ok? Ok. Click here. In the... uh, great. So, thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be there. And uh, I would like to, to thank uh, again uh, Jackson, uh, Raimundo, uh, Raimundo, and uh, Laurent for the, the, the very kind invitation. And uh, so it's uh, a talk uh, today about uh, application of oligosaccharides in nanomedicine strategies. Well, I have two comments before beginning this talk. Um, first, uh, I think it's quite, the first part will be quite unusual and very focused on uh, nanomedicine challenges. But uh, in the second part, you will see the, the natural products uh, arriving on the how we can uh, take advantage of the natural products in, uh, in uh, some uh, of the nanomedicine formulations. And uh, then what I will uh, talk about is uh, mainly about uh, cancer, but uh, I definitely think that some of the features or some of the comments can apply also for, um, for others, um, other pathologies. Uh, well, we can start uh, with uh, one of the biggest problem of chemotherapy for uh, cancer treatment. In fact, uh, they all rely uh, on the inhibition of uh, DNA replication, and you have two major drawbacks with this. First is uh, cytotoxicity, and then uh, the treatment is not able to differentiate an healthy cells to uh, cancer cells. So what happens is uh, when you inject the drugs, you will only have a very small fraction reaching the, the tumor for limited efficiency before uh, apparition of resistance to the treatment. And also this treatment will uh, damage the LC tissue and uh, you will have a lot of uh, deleterious and adverse effects uh, for the patient. So what we are uh, now uh, trying to, to do is, uh, one word is tar targeting, is to find uh, much more uh, uh, treatment which have this targeting feature. So you have plenty ways to, to get uh, targeting on targeted treatment. 
you can try to find new specific targets in the tumor macro environment. You can try to make some chemosensibilization, uh, molecular vectorization, immunotherapy, and what I will uh, talk about. Uh, uh, what I will talk about uh, you today is uh, nanomedicine. The purpose of nanomedicine is uh, a dream: is to to try to to bring the, the drugs directly inside the tumor and also to be able to visualize the efficiency of the treatment. For this, uh, we use uh, nanoparticles and these nanoparticles have uh, one specific feature that just tend between the molecular level, uh, levels and the cellular levels. So there are, it's a size perfectly adapted to functionalize the um, uh, the nanoparticles by several specific molecules that will ensure one specific role. Uh, and at the end, you will have a very highly advanced nanoformulation able to cross biological barriers, to, um, to recognize the tumor tissue and to deliver one drug or one uh, diagnostic probe. However, you, you still have many, many obstacles uh, in order that this uh, very promising nanoparticles uh, be uh, reach the clinics and uh, in order that we can use usually these nanoparticles uh, in hospitals. And uh, if you look a little bit at um, a review made by the expert of the fields, you can uh, find at the end four main challenges that I, I, I will uh, now present you. So challenges in the development of nanoparticles for targeted uh, therapy. And the first challenge is uh, to optimize the pharmacokinetics. In fact, when you, when you inject these nanoparticles and the uh, enzymes uh, bloodstream, they can be rapidly removed by the organ of elimination, especially liver. So you will have no chance uh, the nanoparticles uh, get uh, arrived to the, to the tumor. One research and uh, one strategy is to find some coatings of the nanoparticles that are able to prolong the vascular lifetime. And one very standard example is uh, polyethylene glycol. And we show that uh, phosphatidylcholine is also able to give these properties for the nanoparticles. And we get a very nice vascular lifetime in rat up to 12 hours. Another uh, very important point now in the development of nanoparticles is that we try to now have uh, the urinary and uh, kidney clearance. Uh, the, the reasons for that is we, try, we would like to try to avoid uh, the toxicity uh, which comes from uh, a slow metabolization in the liver. So to, to get this kidney clearance, this implies to, to develop nanoparticles below 10 nanometers, that is... Um, the kidney threshold uh, for filtration. Well, the, the second challenge will be to, to improve the accumulation of the nanoparticles in the, in the tumor. So this, um, this accumulation first rely on um, a vascular system around the tumor that is uh, not perfect and let the nanoparticle penetrated uh, in, the, in the stroma. This is called uh, what we call enhanced permeability and retention effect. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this EPR effect is, is very debated in, uh, in the nanomedicine community. And uh, I think it's because sometimes it's, um, it's oversimplified. The effect um, um, is uh, very different from one patient to another. This is the first point. And uh, is also um, depends a lot of the physical chemical characteristic of the nanoparticles. And uh, from my point of view, what is the most important is that this effect uh, doesn't ensure that the nanoparticles reach the cancer cells, because once they are in the stroma, they are evolving in a very complex microenvironment made of other cell types and uh, very uh, dense macromolecular uh, tissue. So this will impede the nanoparticles to reach the cancer cells that, that are inside in the heart of the, of the tumor before uh, and they will, uh, they will be uh, again uh, put again in the circulation. So I think this is uh, the major point. So 
if you really want your nanoparticles stay uh, in the stroma, uh, what is important is to try to take advantage of specific um, biomarkers you can find in the microenvironment that are much more accessible than the cancer cells. So here is the first example uh, you can see um, uh, down on the right. Uh, you can add a targeting ligand that will um, interact with um, with a biomarker of the endothelial cells that uh, are forming because of the angiogenesis. And uh, the ligand is a RGD peptide and it will uh, interact with, um, with integrins. And you can see on the image that uh, we uh, reach a um, very nice um, accumulation uh, on the right, but we can also see um, a very high liver accumulation. So we can see the first problem I, I talked to you about uh, in the first challenge. And the second option, uh, which is uh, my point of view, very, very nice option is also to, to develop uh, coatings that uh, will be degraded by enzymes, which are overexpressed in the um, in the microenvironment. And when they will de degrade the coatings, you can uh, release a drug. So this is a drug release modalities. And uh, here on the left, uh, down on the left, you can uh, you can see um, you can see the phospholipid coating uh, nanoparticles is degraded by an enzyme called phospholipase C. And this uh, will uh, enable us to, to release a drug. Uh, we, we made the proof of concept for atherosclerosis plaque, where phospholipase enzyme is uh, highly overexpressed. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this can be um, transposable to, to, to more microenvironment as well, because it's, uh, it's also phospholipase is also um, a, a biomarker of tumor microenvironment. The third challenge uh, you will have is to reach the personalized medicine. So the, the first purpose and the main purpose of this kind of, uh, of nanoformulation on nanoparticles is to carry a drug to tumor tissue for targeted therapy. But you can, so you can also add um, an imaging modality in order to visualize the accumulation of the nanoparticles in the tumor and to select the patient uh, who will answer um, to the to the therapy and the patient who will not answer to the therapy. So um, before many research group like to add the two modalities is uh, drug modalities and the imaging modalities modality in the in the same nano formulation. However, the, the reality in clinics is that. Um, you, you will not make a lot of imaging procedure. Maybe a patient will undergo a two, three uh, imaging procedure for the diagnostic, but, but no more. So you, you are here trying to synthesize from a chemistry point of view, something very difficult, but we, which will be useful only one or two times. So now the strategy is more to develop in parallel uh, two nanoparticles, one therapeutic nanoparticles and one reporter probes uh, which uh, which is exactly the, the mimic of the therapeutic uh, nanocarrier. And uh, for this, what is important is that this reporter process be as um, as much as possible uh, similar to the to the drug the drug carrier. So here is uh, an example of uh, one uh, new generation of uh, nanoparticles. It's iron oxide nanoparticles. So this quite, uh, it's a type of nanoparticles which is uh, uh, known now for decades. But uh, here it's a new generation, which is uh, uh, really interesting first because they can provide uh, positive uh, contrast in uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And this kind of nanoparticles uh, were very well known for the um, uh, for negative contrast, uh, but um, this contrast uh, was not so useful um, for the clinics and leads to to images difficult to read. And the uh, clinics is now uh, much more uh, appreciating the um, the positive contrast. So we have this new generation able able to 
to give a positive contrast in MRI. And moreover, you can dump the iron oxide core with uh, some radioisotope in order to make some nuclear imaging. And nuclear imaging is really the more sensitive medical imaging we have now at our disposition. So at the end, you can get a really nice reporter probes with a dual modality. One is a MRI and one is a PET imaging. And you can really follow your nanoparticles on the biodistribution in the, in the body. And the last challenge uh, is to uh, really is to, to, to ease the transfer to clinic. Uh, why? Because um, this kind of nanoparticles, multifunctional nanoparticles, are more uh, are more sophisticated, and it asks uh, tedious synthesis, uh, multi-step synthesis, and this is uh, very difficult. Uh, so you can do it in the lab, but make it uh, after uh, at uh, industrial scale is uh, much more difficult. So I think to to tackle these problems, what is uh, very important is to to propose some simplified original formulation which. Uh, are um, easier to prepare and, uh, and with this in mind you can uh, you can eventually uh, things to high scale um, preparation and for simplified formulation for example you can use uh, coatings stabilizing coatings of nanoparticles but these coatings can also ensure simultaneous functions and uh, like this you have kind of two in one or three in one role uh, this is uh, for example um, the case for the phosphatidylcholine coated nanoparticles I present you because they ensure at the same time the, the coating, the stabilizing coating uh, role, but also uh, the targeting uh, moiety for um, for targeted accumulation in uh, in tumor. And on the same um, principle, in another work we have uh, patented this work is um, we used antimitotic glycolipid, and this time. They ensure at the same time the role of coatings and the role of uh, of therapeutic. So um, here it is, and what I think it's very important uh, is to keep in mind the transversal vision. If really you, you want uh, to be uh, successful in the development of uh, of uh, this kind of nanocarrier and uh, nanomedicine. You have to keep in mind all the challenges and not uh, enclose only in one challenge. And uh, what uh, the works I just um, present you were basically the work that I, I made during my uh, my PhD. And after I moved to La Rochelle University in the team of uh, of Laurent uh, Laurent Picot, who is uh, who is here, uh, BCBS uh, team in the Lyons Laboratory. And this um, this um, this team uh, also is very interested in native polysaccharides. And now we are reaching uh, a little bit more um, natural uh, product chemistry. Mm. So this um, high molecular wise molecules you can extract them from uh, many uh, different natural resources. And uh, in the body, they are essential. It's one of the essential com uh, component of the body as a supply of energy, but also as interface of many metabolisms, cell metabolisms. The thing is that they have multiple bioactivities of interest, but they also own some unwanted uh, bioactivities. And the, the team uh, in La Rochelle is specialized to prepare oligosaccharide, which are the, the low molecular waste derivatives that we prepare by a technique of depolymerization. And these oligosaccharides have much more uh, definite structure and more specific bioactivities. And um, what, uh, so I, I arrived in La Rochelle in order to set up new approaches in nanomedicine with these oligosaccharides, but first I, I get, um, I, I learn a little bit more about uh, carbohydrate chemistry because I, I didn't know this field before. And uh, especially uh, I have worked on uh, two polysaccharides, very interesting, heparin and lambda caraginan. They are, they are um, very interesting for the treatment of many tumors and especially because um, 
there are inhibitors of heparanase. Heparanase is um, an extracellular enzyme overexpressed in uh, many tumor microenvironment, and uh, this enzyme is playing really a key role in the progression of the disease. And um, so we are we are definitely looking to new inhibitors and heparin and lambda caragan and R, but the problem is that they also have some adverse uh, effect for um, for the for the treatment that are respectively anticoagulant effect and pro-inflammatory properties. So I will take advantage not to give a little bit more about uh, the structure and the strategies of why we can have some uh, more specific bioactivities with oligosaccharide. And I will do this example with uh, heparin. So heparin is a linear, quite complex polysaccharide. Uh, main disaccharide unit is uh, iduronic acid conjugated to uh, glucosamine uh, with uh, N-sulfatation and it's variably sulfated. So it's quite a complex poly polysaccharide. And inside this long chain, you have some sequences responsible of the anticoagulant activities we want to get rid of. And you also have some sequences responsible of the anti heparanase activities that we want to keep. And when you apply um, the polymerization process, you will cut, hydrolyze this uh, glycosic, uh, glycosidic bond. And all the game at the end is to try to affect the sequence of the unwanted um, uh, biological effect and to preserve the sequences of the activities of interest. You can also, uh, after or before the depolymerization, make some uh, adjusted chemical modification to remove one sulfat or to open a ring in order to, to affect uh, the uh, unwanted sequences. Um, so it is, on, in fact, for heparin, we have a re quite a, a good knowledge of the sequences inside the chain that are responsible of uh, the different bioactivities. But this is not always the case. And the depolymerization experiments can try to serve to find a, a little bit more about the, the function and the sequences responsible inside the chain of one activity. And here I will give you a, another example with um, lambda caraginan. So lambda caraginan is extracted from uh, red seaweed, is a marine polysaccharide, is quite homogeneous polysaccharide. It's a disaccharide of uh, galactopyranose, respectively sulfated in position two on position two and six. And uh, we apply again um, the polymerization method at different time to produce um, oligosaccharide of different lengths and uh, different um, uh, sulfation pattern. And after each of these um, uh, oligosaccharide formulation, we assess the anti heparanase activities and this uh, able us to find that at least one sulfate in the sequences is not necessary for the inhibition of heparanase. So we we make a, a very little progress, very little progress about uh, what is necessary inside this uh, oligosaccharides to to inhibit um, uh, heparanase activities. And uh, I think we are reaching know the major point of the, the presentation is how uh, with these uh, very interesting molecules we can uh, uh, set up new approaches in uh, in nanomedicine and in fact native polysaccharides are already widely used in nano formulation some of these uh, several of them are widely used and uh, mainly as coating why because um, uh, these coatings uh, are really appreciated because they are biocompatible. They can give to the nanoparticles a very good colloidal stability and they are very easy to functionalize with other uh, molecules, for example, targeting ligands, drugs, etc. However, you still have a lot of drawbacks on, um, on bottlenecks. Mm. The first one is that because of this uh, very high molecular weight, and because of um, this uh, heterogeneous structure, 
the polysaccharides will give um, uncertain in vivo behavior to the uh, nanoparticles. With um, the, the pharmacokinetics properties well, will not be so good. You Usually you have a very fast elimination in the liver. And the second uh, biggest problem is that because of the um, unwanted and uh, adverse bioactivities, many families uh, of polysaccharides are discarded of the application uh, in nanomedicines. And uh, they can have a high potential, but because they have these uh, unwanted uh, properties, they will be discarded from the application. And this is... Um, so this is something we wanted to, to solve. And the, the strategy is, uh, at the end, quite simple. We will not use the native polysaccharide in the coating of the nanoparticles. We will use the depolymerized derivatives, the oligosaccharides. These the oligosaccharides are seriously understudied still uh, in research. And uh, they are very promising because they have more definite structure and more specific bioactivity. So they can give, uh, we can have um, a higher control of uh, the behavior of the nanoparticles in vivo. And uh, what is very important is uh, because this oligosaccharide can get rid of, um, uh, of the um, deleterious properties of the native parents, you can open the application to the other family. And uh, for instance, in this family, there is a uh, heparin and carrageenan I was uh, talking um, about. And this family are very promising because I think with this in mind, they can give an inclusive answer. Maybe they will give an inclusive answer of the four challenges I, uh, I present you in the first part of this presentation. Why? Uh, of, of smaller size, oligosaccharides can provide a uh, higher vascular lifetime to nanoparticles and also uh, a, a size small enough to, to ensure the renal clearance. As I showed you before, they can interact and inhibit some components of the tumor microenvironment, which are accessible um, biomarkers, for instance, the heparin as I talked you about. And you can find the um, easy and simple formulation where the oligosaccharide play at the same time the um, coating function, the targeting ligand function, and the drug function. So this kind of functional coatings based on oligosaccharides, you, you can potentially apply to many different platforms of uh, nanoparticles. But uh, here we, we, uh, we are using the... Um, the new generation of iron oxide nanoparticles I, I talked to you before. So just to remind you, this uh, new generation is able to provide a positive uh, contrast in MRI. You can dub the core with a radioisotope for uh, advanced uh, MRI PET reporter probe that will answer uh, the new personalized medicine um, challenge. And also, and this is... Uh, also, to my mind, a very important point. When the iron oxide nanoparticles is not used uh, for its um, imaging properties, uh, a new research is now getting interest of the ability of these nanoparticles to immunomodulate the tumor-associated macrophages, and especially to, well, kind of to wake up the macrophages to a pro-inflammatory status in order they they come back to, to attack the, the cancer cells. The general strategy we are developing is uh, in uh, three, four tasks. So we start from the heparin and lambda carrageenan um, polysaccharide, and we uh, will produce different series of oligosaccharides, different series that will differ one parameter, for example, the size, or uh, the charge, because these are uh, sulfated uh, polysaccharides and are highly uh, negatively charged. And the, the objective here is to reduce all the unwanted bioactivities we have from the poly native polysaccharide of origin. 
then we will produce uh, the nanoparticles corresponding to each species. And if uh, we apply and synthesis, uh, synthesize all the nanoparticles with all the species, we will be able to get some range of nanoparticles that uh, is uh, studying one parameter, one particular parameter. For instance, you will have range of uh, nanoparticles with different size, range of nanoparticles with different uh, charge, uh, etc. And like this, um, yes, just a comment to say that we can modify the, um, the, the sulfates to modulate the negative charge. But also, we are planning to bring some positive charge with a, a very famous uh, polysaccharides and uh, oligosaccharide derivatives family, which are the ketosan, which is uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure, but maybe the only positively charged um, uh, polysaccharide family we can find in nature. Um, well, uh, after that, you can, like this, uh, study the influence of each parameter on the pharmacokinetics of the probes, thanks to the PET MRI uh, imaging modalities. Unlike this, uh, we will uh, check all the different parameters to find which are the best candidates. And only after this, we will uh, make some evaluation, in vivo evaluation of the therapeutic activities. So basically, of course, anti heparanase activities and immunomodulation of the macrophage associated to tumor by the iron oxide core. And uh, let's go to, to concrete results. And here is the first proof of concept we have with heparin. So heparin is, is very uh, famous for the clinician because it's already widely used as an anticoagulant. Um, and uh, it's also, as I told you before, uh, widely studied uh, for cancer treatment and among uh, other uh, bioactivities because it's able to inhibit heparanase in the tumor macron one. In the case of the um, oncology, anticoagulant is um, anticoagulant properties. Uh, is not is uh, not wished uh, for treatment of uh, patients who have cancer because these patients have already um, a weak uh, vascu uh, vascular system and you can have some uh, internal bleedings which is very dangerous for the patient so so you don't want this anticoagulant property and to set up um, the landscape of heparin in nanomedicine. So heparin is widely used in conjugation, uh, conjugation with other polysaccharides or polymer, but you have very few nanoparticles reported in, uh, in literature with single heparin coatings, and the few you have have the drawbacks I told uh, you. And uh, for instance, here you can see um, the study uh, of one heparin um, coated nanoparticles and um, the probes. Uh, end up in the liver very fastly. Uh, the full doses end up in the, in the liver. So what what uh, we have done? First, we have prepared the heparin oligosaccharide. So we apply uh, the polymerization reaction at different times. And uh, like this, we have uh, oligosaccharides of uh, different lengths with uh, sm smaller and smaller lengths. And uh, we try to turn to our advantage the balance of bioactivities. And I, I will come back a little bit to, to structure function study. The anticoagulant properties of heparins, we, we would like to, to decrease because we don't want these uh, properties, is uh, mainly coming from the ability of heparin to inhibit thrombin uh, to A. Um, uh, this inhibition, for this inhibition, you need um, a sequence, a specific sequence of five sugar that will activate a regulators called um, AT3. And you also need a sufficiently in, an enough, a long chain enough in order to produce also um, an additional steric ingredients uh, inhibition. So when you depolymerize uh, at the beginning, 
you will not have a reduction of the thrombin inhibition, but at one moment, the, the chain will not be sufficiently long enough and you will have a decrease of this uh, thrombin inhibition. And for the long, longest time, the depolymerization process we are using can also modify the specific uh, pentasaccharidic sequences, uh, which is required to activate the regulator. On the other hand, we have this heparanase inhibition. So this is a good activities we want to keep. And the, the mechanism is uh, less known. Uh, the only thing we know is that there is um, a better versatility in the different sequences uh, that are able to inhibit the, the enzyme. And this is what we found in our results because Apparently, the heparanase inhibition activities is much more preserved along with uh, the polymerization time. So here it is. We have this library of, uh, of oligosaccharide of different lengths. And uh, now we will prepare the, the different nanoparticles. For this, we developed a microwaves um, method. It's a very simple method, one step. It relies on the reduction of iron-3 by, uh, by dracine and a very uh, fast um, heating treatment. And you have the stabilization uh, of the coating directly in uh, this step. So if you apply this method, uh, ah, yes, sorry, uh, we, we are now improving this method by um, get rid of this uh, hydrazine uh, reductor because it's a CMR product, so no we found uh, an alternative, but it's under patent, so, so I, I cannot uh, give you more detail. Well, uh, in any case, when you use this microwave uh, method on all the oligosaccharide derivatives, you will obtain around um, a series of nanoparticles with, um, with um, oligosaccharide of different lengths. So here we have, uh, at the end, uh, it's a representation of five nanoparticles with uh, five um, oligosacchar heparin oligosaccharide coatings of, of different lengths. And the, the first things you, we, we made is to check, to verify that uh, the balance of bioactivities is preserved when the oligosaccharides are uh, integrated to the nanoformulation. And this is, this is the case. Uh, we have um, a good preservation, and uh, finally, we have also the, the the good surprise to to see that the anticoagulant properties dis disappear even um, faster. And maybe the reason why is when um, when the heparin uh, oligosaccharide derivatives is attached to the nanoparticles you will lose some uh, freedom uh, degree of the chain that will not be able to make this kind of bridging assembly and the additional steric endurance that is uh, um, necessary for uh, the thrombin inhibition. Then we also uh, see that the heparin uh, oligosaccharide lens size, the heparin size, the oligosaccharide size will also um, control the core size of the iron uh, the iron oxide core size during the synthesis. And smaller will be the oligosaccharide, smaller will be the iron oxide core. And this will have a lot of uh, repercussion on the magnetic properties and uh, especially on the ability of these nanoparticles to provide positive contrast in MRI. So you, you can see this on this, uh, on this uh, MRI images we made on uh, LC mice. So on the left uh, for the three image, you have uh, before injection of the nanoparticles at the center is 15 minutes after uh, injection. And uh, you can see that for the three nanoparticles, we definitely have um, a good um, positive contrast and you can see the vasculature of the, of the mice, especially the abdominal aorta. But what you can see also is that for the, um, the heparin de derivatives of, 
of the highest size, the signal is much more intense. And this is correlated with uh, iron oxide core, which, uh, which are also a little bit bigger. The main results we have been able to see uh, of the, about the influence of the size of the oligosaccharide uh, heparin coatings for the nanoparticles is a drastic shift in uh, biodistribution. And you can see this on the images. This is uh, um, positive emission tomography images made on, um, on uh, mice with um, xenograft, uh, cancer cells xenograft. And you can see that you have really a dramatic shift uh, from hepatic to uh, renal clearance. And what is very interesting is that you only have one very specific size that is able to provide a probe that have a good vascular lifetime, moderate accumulation, and uh, part of uh, renal uh, um, clearance, which is now what uh, we are seeking. So now, uh, thanks to this first study, we have been able to identify the one candidate, and now we are trying to improve even more the pharmacokinetics properties by uh, modulating the charge of uh, this uh, heparin derivatives. And uh, on the other hand, we are now beginning to make some uh, evaluation of the therapeutic effect of the nanoparticles on a little bit more advanced um, uh, cell-based models uh, before we are uh, maybe uh, in the near future to go to in vivo uh, essay with a mice model of tumor. So we will focus on the two bioactivities possible, anti-heparin activities from the heparin properties and immunomodulation of tumor acetin macrophages coming from the iron oxide core. I will just finish the presentation uh, with uh, a last example, very, uh, very interesting. It's results we get uh, last week. So and this, uh, uh, for us, has uh, confirmed uh, all the um, promises bring by the strategy to, 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 to make some um, oligosaccharide application to nanomedicine. Uh, the, I cannot name the polysaccharides because uh, we are under protection and uh, under a patent for other work. It's a polysaccharide uh, also uh, coming from marine natural resources. And what I can say to you, is that uh, this uh, polysaccharide have many anti-cancer bioactivities, very interesting anti-cancer bioactivities. But, and this has been really a surprise, we didn't find any study uh, in literature about medical imaging with um, this polysaccharide uh, conjugated to nanoparticles. And in fact, even uh, very small, uh, very few uh, in vivo studies using this polysaccharide. So we don't, we don't know why. So it's a very high molecular weight polysaccharide. You also have some adverse activities because of this very high molecular weight. Sometimes it's a only a research fashion that didn't get interested, but will soon interest in this polysaccharide. Uh, but in any case, we see here a high innovation potential. So we try to make the first proof of concept and uh, in this case, we just prepare one oligosaccharide derivative and we conjugate this derivative on uh, iron oxide nanoparticles to perform some in vivo uh, biodistribution preliminary experiment. And this is very preliminary, it's only two mice. What uh, you can see here is uh, MRI images of the liver before and after injection of the nanoparticles. And you can see here a change of the contrast. So this means that the nanoparticles are accumulated in liver, which is a, a very known way of elimination. And you have a, a blood, uh, um, a vascular lifetime of about four hours, which is quite fair at the end. More interesting, a fraction of these nanoparticles are also um, eliminated through the kidneys. And much more interested, uh, apparently, a fraction is accumulated specifically in brain. Uh, so this is uh, 
this could be very promising, especially if we show that it's able to cross the blood-brain barrier, but this really needs to be, to be confirmed. Um, finally, I would like to thank all the collaborators that have uh, participated or are participating to, to this work um, here in the group, but also with a, a very close partner uh, in uh, San Sebastian in the CIC Biomagon Center, uh, who are um, making all the in vivo experiments, uh, nice in vivo experiments I, I have shown to you. Of course, the fundings and especially La Ligue contre le cancer and uh, La Région Nou Nouvelle Aquitaine, who, who, who fund us. And uh, thanks you for your, for your attention. I hope that. Yeah, 40 minutes. I think it's okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I don't know if there is some questions. And, uh... Hi, Hugo. Sorry, my microphone was off. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I, I was a little bit long. I hope uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a, a great, great lecture. Uh, we have some good comments about your conference, and we have also a question for for you from Bruna Leon. I'll just put her question on the screen, and you can uh, answer as when you want. What do you think could be a positive result result of the research with native polysaccharides if it was more accessible to work with? Yes, yeah. Uh, um, at the end, um, you you have you already have some uh, family of polysaccharides, native polysaccharides, which are very uh, useful and interesting, and you don't need uh, really to depolymerize them. They are uh, working uh, well. They don't have some adverse. Um, bioactivities for in vivo application. So uh, uh, they, they are already widely used. I'm thinking to ketosan, but uh, also uh, alginate. You, you can uh, so straightly, uh, directly use them, and, uh, and it's interesting, and maybe uh, encapsulate some drugs. This is um, something that is uh, uh, done by uh, many groups. But uh, maybe uh, to think sometimes to depolymerize or go to oligosaccharides, even for this kind of uh, uh, native polysaccharide who didn't show um, really uh, problems, you, you can uh, have some advantages. I think especially because um, it's high molecular weight, so definitively uh, you will have um, nanoparticles uh, with short blood half-life and uh, liver elimination. So you you can use them, but you can bring some uh, additional advantages, maybe uh, using uh, oligosaccharides. I, I hope I have an answer to the question mm -hmm. of Bruna. I just have one question for you. It's about the heparinized overexpression in cancer cells. Uh, in uh, fact, uh, I would like to know if heparinized is always overexpressing all kind of tumor cell line or there is specific tumor cell lines which heparinase is more expressive than others? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, thanks for the question, Raimundo. It's, um, it's a very good biomarker because uh, and uh, highly specific and it's, it's overexpressed in almost all, all kind of um, tumor. But some tumors overexpress it more than others. But uh, at the end, is quite um, well. Is a, is a quite a good biomarker for almost all type of tumors. It's extracellular enzymes, and, uh, and uh, here it is. But it's also the only thing is is, is also biomarkers for other pathologies, especially inflammation. So okay. it's very good biomarkers to distinguish uh, LC tissue to tumor tissue, but you, it's, you cannot use it as a biomarker to, to distinguish uh, 
inflammated uh, tissue to to tumor tissue. Mm, that's nice. Okay, we have another question from Brenda Carini. Uh, what's your vision about the future opportunities of nanotechnology in human health? <laughs> uh, well, this is. Uh, well, I don't know. Do you have uh, all the night to answer <laughs> this question? Uh, I, I definitely think that um, nanomedicine arrived. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think the, the first one is uh, Elrich and late 60s, and you have a uh, first generation of nanoparticles maybe in the uh, 90s. And at, at the beginning, it was kind of many people get directly straightly interested in nanomedicine kind of this will be the revolution and at the end at one moment we all the scientific communities noticed that uh, was not so evident and um, what is good is i think now we are reaching kind of uh, maturity and we are addressing new problems that i i try to 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 show you a little bit at the beginning of the presentation this kind of uh, clearance route, this kind of uh, accumulation also, um, properties, how to improve the accumulation, uh, the personalized medicine, and uh, no, all the research is um, taking this into account. So I, I definitely think that you will have some uh, very huge breakthrough about, um, about this kind of formulation. And, and in this uh, presentation, I, I uh, only talked about uh, uh, drug carrier and uh, uh, nano formulation, but nanotechnology, the world nanotechnology is also a lot of other technologies for, for example, uh, detection, uh, the, the, um, the fast uh, detection of uh, COVID-19 uh, antigenic is, uh, is gold nanoparticles, for instance. So I definitely think this will bring some breakthrough in, uh, in human health. Perfect, Hugo. So we have more uh, interesting comments about your presentation. Just congratulations for you for your presentation. Thank you very much for spending your time here with us. It's really a pleasure yes. to, us, to have thanks you here in our you, Congress. It's a pleasure <laughs> and thanks again to invite me. And, uh, anytime, anytime, really my friend. Day. I hope next time you, you do the presentation here at the symposium be in Brazil. <laughs> I like to, I like to. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you very much. Merci. Thanks to you, thanks, Jackson. So bon, people. Para próxima. Yeah. I uh I have to go to stop something. Uh, uh no no, don't worry. I you take you off of the screen, don't worry. Pronto, pessoal. Então, vamos dar a sequência aqui a mais uma palestra. Agora vamos ter a palestra do professor Laurent Picot, da Universidade de La Rochelle, na França. O professor Laurent é biólogo, mestre em farmacologia celular e molecular pela Université Paris, de Paris, doutor em microbiologia pela Université de Rouen, na França, é professor e pesquisador da La Rochelle Université, atuando no laboratório Lian, onde integra a equipe Biotecnologia e Química de Biorecursos em Saúde e coordena o eixo temático de substâncias naturais bioativas na terapia anti-câncer. Sua área de expertise inclui biotecnologia marinha, bioquímica marinha, farmacologia marinha, pigmentos, produtos naturais e sintéticos com potencial anti-câncer, né, principalmente trabalhando com modelos de melanoma. Então, o professor Louvon também é um grande parceiro nosso, né, então, em 2019, nós lançamos oficialmente né, a, a rede, o Franco Brasília Network, né, um Natural Products, né, que tem como coordenador francês o professor Loron e eu, o professor Jackson, né, o doutor Raimundo Júnior, aqui no Brasil, como coordenadores brasileiros. Então, professor Loron, é um grande prazer, mais uma vez, receber é, você aqui no nosso evento. Tá certo? Se tivesse sendo presencial, era a terceira vez né, que o Loron estaria 
aqui no Brasil, esteve em 2015, durante o simpósio de farmacognosia, esteve em 2019, né? e agora em 2021 estamos participando aqui, é, mesmo que virtual, mas receba aí o nosso caloroso abraço, né? desse calorzinho aqui de 35, 37 graus, que está fazendo aqui em Petrolina. Né? Eu estou falando em português porque o professor Lohon é, já é fluente em português, né? então é, o Raimundo é, Júnior, ele foi aluno do professor Lohon, fez doutorado na França, né? E aí trocaram muitas ideias, Raimundo aprendeu francês fluente, então Lohon também já é fluente em português, e aí a gente pode se comunicar um pouco, mas professor Lohon, fique à vontade para fazer sua conferência no idioma que você escolher, né? Em português ou em inglês, fique à vontade. Inglês é bom. Thank you, Mr. <risos> merci, merci beaucoup, Jackson. Uh... Je, je suis vraiment euh, ravi, ravi de participer à, à cette conférence. Uh, so, I, uh, sorry, I, I am absolutely uh, very happy to, to participate to this conference and it's a great, great honor to be with you, a great pleasure and thank you for the invitation. So, I like to give my congratulations to, to the organizing committee for this very nice event very high scientific uh, uh, quality and uh, it's it's always so nice to to see all my brazilian colleagues and friends and i'm, I'm really uh, you know like in in heaven with you <laughs> so i'm going to try to share my my uh, powerpoint and maybe just tell you that my internet connection is not so good so i hope that uh, we won't have any trouble uh, during the, the presentation So I will share my screen. Okay. Okay. So today I'm going to today I'm going to talk about plant natural product for phototherapy. And uh, in fact, I will uh, in the first step talk about phototherapy and then discuss about the potential of Brazilian plants and world plant for phototherapy. So it, it is called a review of species, photosensitizers, application and focus on the potential of Brazilian biodiversity. So this is a uh, uh, Franco-Brazilian. Oui? Uh, pardon, yes? mais tu n'as pas encore partagé ton écran, je pense. Ah, ok. Alors, il me sur dit share, que si, ouais, share. Ah, ah, ah oui, d'accord. Partager. Partager. Est-ce que... Vas-y, après tu choisis euh, l'écran que tu veux partager. Euh, tout l'écran. Ouais. ouais. Okay. Partager. Et ouais, Et là, ça, est en train de... ça doit Il être... est en train de télécharger. Ouais, ça, ça doit ça arriver. Ah ouais, ouais, ok. Ok. D'accord. Dis-moi voilà. aussi si les diapos passent bien, comme ça je pourrais vérifier. Ouais, c'est nickel. Hein, All right. So, so in the first, uh, in the first step, in the first step, I will talk about uh, phototherapy and, and and then discuss the discuss the, the use of uh, plants for phototherapy. Uh, so, uh, so uh, really a great thanks to to the university team uh, for organizing this, this meeting and uh, uh, I hope that uh, very soon we will be able to meet uh, all together in France or in, uh, in Brazil. Um, so uh, in the first step I will give a short presentation of, of my lab. So I'm in the same lab as, as Hugo, uh, UMRC and RS Lyons in La Rochelle University. Then I'll discuss about phototoxicity, phototherapy and use of photosensitizers. And I'll show you some first project with uh, marine, uh, marine drugs. And then I, will, uh, then I will talk about some uh, new projects with, with uh, plants. Uh, so here, here are a few uh, photos of uh, La Rochelle. So La Rochelle is a very pleasant uh, city to live, and we are close to the Atlantic Ocean. It's a very, very nice place. Uh, and the, the, the lab, the university, is uh, located on the seaside uh, front. So we just have to cross uh, one, one street, and we are 
very close to, to the sea. So uh, at the moment, we're working in this uh, building, which is called Marie Curie building. And uh, in this building, uh, there are only the biochemists of, of the lab. But the lab is, is very big, and we have an institute of uh, littoral and environment. And this institute is uh, a big, big uh, building. And very soon, we will uh, go in an extension of uh, this building. Uh, Raimundo, can you confirm that uh, the slides are going well? Yes? Yes, it's perfect. You can go okay. on. Okay, thank you very much, my friend. Uh, so, uh, in the lab, we are about 70 research scientists, professors, mostly some uh, university professors, and we have 30 engineers, 40 PhD, postdoc. So, it's it's quite a big uh, unit, and it's an interdisciplinary lab. So, we, we are all working on the topic of uh, the sea, the littoral, and uh, there are some uh, chem chemists, some uh, biochemists, some marine biologists, some historians of some geographs too. So it's really, uh, we, are, we are very interesting interdisciplinary uh, uh, discussions. And also, uh, the good thing is that this big lab, we have a lot of facilities. So we can go, for example, sampling uh, uh, water or marine animals. We can go sampling some mud. We have uh, facilities for marine microbiology, cell culture, pharmacology, chemistry, and uh, uh, characterization of uh, marine drugs, uh, any, any kind of, uh, of uh, molecules. So it's, it's really a very, very good lab. So uh, the team, the biochemist and chemist team, is called Biotechnology and Bioresources for, for Earth, so BCBS. And uh, we are about usually 25 to 30 uh, uh, friends, scientists working with uh, chemists, biochemists, and enzymologists, pharmacologists, and, and uh, also microbiologists. Uh, so the, the topic of our research is mainly dedicated to the study of uh, natural uh, products. So uh, chemists are mainly working with medicinal chemistry of uh, natural products for making pharmacomodulation to obtain some uh, molecules of interest for treatment of cancer, infection, inflammation, obesity. Uh, we have a big, big part of our project, which is uh, dedicated to the study of uh, plant anti-cancer drugs for chemotherapy and phototherapy. And of course, uh, as you have just seen with uh, Hugo, we have a lot of uh, projects dedicated to marine resources, uh, including marine polysaccharides from seaweed, microalgae, proteins, pigments, heterocycles, and so on. So I'm in charge of uh, the, the topic of uh, pigments and heterocycle in the lab. And uh, we have some chemists and some uh, pharmacologists and biochemists work working in this topic. So as you may also know, and uh, Professor Grunier has already talked about this, uh, we have decided in 2019 to, to, um, to, to build a Franco-Brazilian network on natural products. So we are very happy with this with this network, although it started at a very bad time for exchanges of researchers and students. But uh, <clears throat> many, many labs have re answered positively to be involved in the project. So we have lab uh, with, uh, which are more dedicated to chemistry, pharmacognosy, marine drugs, phycology, screening platform, pharmacology, toxicology. And really, in my opinion, there is a, a um, a positive uh, a will to, to go on uh, on this project. So at the moment, we have a preliminary website, which I invite you to have a look. And of course, you can contact us if you want to join and be involved in the project. And also, of course, uh, we love to welcome Brazilian colleagues, students, and friends in La Rochelle. So, uh, of course, Jackson has already uh, visited La Rochelle twice, and uh, Raimundo wa was made his PhD with me uh, during uh, three years. He was also my master student. We had uh, Arthur, Carlos Arthur Gouveia from uh, UFPB in uh, Joao Pessoa. He was here for uh, one year sandwich uh, PhD, and he also uh, purified some new molecules from uh, plant roots. Uh, and uh, my uh, next PhD student was also recruited in, uh, in uh, Petrolina. So maybe you know him, his name is Luis. And now he's waiting for the visa to come in uh, La Rochelle. 
So now I will talk about phototoxicity and photosensitizer. So we can define a phototoxic compound. Uh, it's a natural or synthetic molecule able to absorb light and to induce some cytotoxic uh, uh, photochemical processes. So I will talk about PS to say photosensitizer because the word is not so easy to, to, to pronounce, so PS. Okay, so PS are usually pigments, antibiotics, heterocyclic conjugated molecules like uh, coumarins, porphyrins, naphtodiantron, and they contain some, uh, this molecule contains some P electron rich microcycles, so some electrons that can move in, in the molecule. And usually phototoxic compounds are commonly designated as photosensitizer, PS. Okay. So phototoxic means that it's the adverse effect of this molecule, its toxicity. And photosensitizer uh, means that they can be adequately used to, to kill cancer cells, to kill vascular cells in the tumor microenvironment, or even patho pathogens like uh, viruses, bacteria, or fungi. So here is an example of uh, skin photosensitization with a ficus la latex, which is very well known. So ficus latex contains some uh, furanocumarin, some uh, psoralen. And if you, if you are in contact uh, your skin with the latex, and then you go to, to the sunlight, then you will have a contact photo phytodermatosis, uh, which uh, induce uh, severe burns uh, in humans. And so, um, Phototoxicity is uh, usually uh, seen in people that are in, in close contact with plants. So gardeners, farmers, employees of uh, processing companies uh, working with plants, and also uh, consumers like, uh, for example, a consumer with essential oils and uh, also children. So for essential oils, uh, some uh, regulation is, is very strict to limit the risk of uh, phototoxicity. And now the consumers are aware of the, the risk of phototoxicity. Uh, so uh, basically, I will not go into the detail of the physics of uh, photoactivation, but uh, a PS can be photoactivated, so it, it will absorb a, a photon. It's in, in fact, it's an electron of the compound that will absorb the photon and then go to an excited singlet state. So this, um, this is a, a usually very... Uh, quick uh, state and the, the compound is excited so it's not going to to stay a long time at, at the, in this situation so the, the first possibility is to go back to the the low energy level by emitting a new photon uh, by fluorescence or even by some phosphorescence uh, uh, in uh, from uh, from another uh, situation but uh, what is interesting in uh, excitation of, of PS is that sometimes they can make what we call intersystem crossing and there is a spin inversion in, in the electron. So the electron is going to go to an excited triplet, triplet state. And at this moment, it will go back to the low energy level by two kind of reaction. The first one is to transfer an electron to, for example, to some substrates, like, for example, a, a molecular dioxygen. And this will lead to the formation of radical compounds, which we call re reactive oxygen species, ROS. And the second possibility is a type 2 energy transfer that will lead to the formation of singlet dioxygen. Um, so, these compounds are, are highly reactive and they will react in, in very close uh, molecules. So they are not going to stay for a long time in, in the place. And uh, what, what they are going to do is to oxidize, uh, oxidize the amino acids, leading to protein fragmentation, cross-linkage of protein. They could also induce lipoperoxidation oxidation of nitrogenous bases in nucleic acid. So of course, the cells are going to suffer from a high oxidation leading to cell death like apoptosis, necrosis, autophagy. And of course, these cells, they have some antioxidant defense mechanisms, but the, the drastic oxidative stress is going to exceed the antioxidant defense mechanism. And 
That's the same exactly for uh, bacteria or even viral envelopes. So uh, the, this uh, radical compounds and uh, singlet oxygen is going to, to destroy, in fact, the, the membrane of the bacteria and the viral envelope. So uh, at the moment, uh, a few molecules are on the market for phototherapy. Only four have a natural origin. And as you can see on this slide, most of them, they are porphyrin or chlorine. So they, they are chlorophyll der derivatives. And so the, 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 there are a few structural variations between these, these compounds that limit their application and range of uh, wavelength absorption. Uh, so I will show you the different generation of uh, PS. Um, these compounds, they have a lot of limitation in terms of uh, pharmacokinetics, ki kinetics in terms of bioavailability. Some uh, are composed of mixture of molecules and some, most of them are, uh, are not so uh, selective. So they will go into the skin and induce some secondary phototoxicity. Uh, so th that's a big problem because the patient has to stay for a long time in the dark to avoid phototoxicity, adverse pho phototoxicity. And so uh, this limitation uh, justifies the need to find some new PS and some new innovative PS. So the first generation of PS, they were uh, chlorine and porphyrin. They had some long clearance time, low chemical purity, and very short ex excitation wavelength. But in fact, not so many molecules are able to, to make the transition that I've shown you, uh, the interconversion system. For example, mostly uh, porphyrins chlorophylls and even curcumin can do this kind of uh, uh, conversion. So in this, this compound, they were first developed in the 90s and so they were not uh, really uh, efficient and they were uh, rapidly uh, replaced by some new innovative uh, compounds. So chemists have tried to make some pharmacomodulation and to find some new molecular scaffold to find some new PS. So for example, they introduced some heavy atoms like uh, halogens or me metals to announce uh, the, the activity of, of the compounds to produce some singlet oxygen uh, when it is photoactivated and thus increasing the cytotoxic effect of the compound. They, they also uh, try to improve uh, the, the fact that uh, these compounds tend to aggregate in uh, water solution. So when you inject them in the bloodstream, uh, they, they could uh, aggregate and they could uh, give a pro problem. So incorpor incorporation of a central metal atom can uh, uh, limit this aggregation. And also, of course, chemists have made some pharmacomodulation to change the wavelength uh, absorption uh, ph physical chemical properties and also to improve the lipophilicity of this compound and, and uh, to improve the cellular uptake of these compounds. So these are the second generation of photosensitizers of PS. And the third one I will discuss later are these compounds, but with some modifications that allow to function, functionalize them and to vectorize them on bacteria, on tumor cells and, and uh, viruses. So I, I wonder what's an ideal photosynthesizer? What, what uh, what is required to get an interesting compound. So, of course, if you have an original molecule and you can make a patent or, uh, with its, its use, it's very interesting. It should have a high chemical purity and stability and a high photostability because if you send some light on it and if it is uh, destroyed uh, immediately, it will not be able to, to be used as a PS. So you need to have a, a short time for photo irradiation uh, of the patient. Or, um, if you want to find a good PS, the best compound would be non-cytotoxic, cytotoxic in the dark. That means that it has no cytotoxicity. 
when you do not put the light and highly phototoxic. That means when you send the light, it's going to, to liberate a high amount of uh, reactive oxygen species. So uh, uh, the best thing is to have a, a molecule with a high capacity for quantum generation of uh, singlet oxygen. And when we are looking for new PS, we use what we call performance index, which is a ratio between phototoxicity and cytotoxicity. So photo, phototoxicity should be very high and cytotoxicity very low. Okay, this compound should be soluble in water, just as I explained, to be able to, to go in the blood and be transported and to limit aggregation. And also it should be amphiphilic because it has to go into the cytoplasmic membrane of the cell, into the intracellular medium, and uh, it, it needs to, to penetrate the, the lipid bilayer. Um, the, the, the risk for this kind of compound is that maybe it could go to the nucleus and have some mutagenic effect. So uh, the best would be to, to have a compound that only goes into the cytoplasm but not into the, the nucleus of, of the cell. Okay, of course, it should be non-allergenic and, and non-photoallergenic, and it should absorb some photons at high molar absorption coefficient and with wavelengths that are used uh, for a phototherapy application. So usually, uh, for phototherapy, we use some uh, red light or some uh, near Infra infrared light uh, between 600 and uh, eight, 850 nanometers um, because this light is able to uh, penetrate the, the skin and to, to excite the photosensitizer into, uh, into the, the place where it is located. And also the compound may be fluorescent so that can be useful, for example, for tumor diagnosis and also to, to get the, the perfect localization of, of the tumor. Okay, so it should be rapidly eliminated from the body to avoid secondary photosensitivity, applicable topically or injectable, and it could be activated using some uh, uh, optic fibers, for example, for, to treat some uh, lung uh, tumors. And uh, it should be also vectorizable to target tumor cells, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, for example. So when we started the phototherapy project, uh, I, I, I didn't know uh, Jackson and Raimundo, and it was uh, 15 years ago. And at this time, we were working with marine microalgae, mostly with marine uh, microalgae pigments. So we obtained a form from the French National Research Agency to screen uh, marine microalgae to find some new PS. So uh, we started working at this time with uh, Jean-Baptiste Bérard, my friend at uh, Ifremer Nantes, so he's, he's part of the Franco-Brazilian network on the natural product too. So he was growing some uh, microalgae and we were extracting some uh, pigments and we could purify some pigment and make the structural characterization of the pigment. And one partner in a uh, hospital in uh, Nantes in France was uh, studying the, the phototherapy activity. And the first project was dedicated mostly to, uh, to find some uh, anti-cancer uh, PS for anti-cancer phototherapy. So the idea is very simple. You inject the PS in, in the body and it's going to concentrate into the, the tumor. And then you can uh, photoactivate the, the compound. And photoactivation, usually with a laser light, is able to induce the photooxidation of the cells and leading to uh, tum apoptosis of uh, tumor cell and necrosis of tumor cells. And this offers a lot of advantages as compared to classical uh, cancer treatment. So you will have an efficient and selective destruction of uh, the tumor. Uh, you can also uh, destroy the what we call the tumor bed, uh, so that's the zone uh, be just beside, just, uh, beside the, the tumor to be sure that you remove all the tumor cells. And you uh, will not have a general uh, cytotoxicity and toxicity. Uh, 
you can treat some topical tumors like melanoma, but also you can treat some internal tumors using endoscopy. And it's applicable to a wide variety of uh, solid tumor. And also it is compatible with the other treatment like uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiotherapy, and so on. And the good thing too is that you do not induce any chemo resistance in, in the tumor cell, like with uh, chemotherapy. So we, we screened a lot, a lot of species and lot, we made a lot of extract. So we selected uh, some uh, representative of uh, microalgae species according to their taxonomic uh, representativeness. And finally, we could find some very, very interesting, interesting extract, very active extract. So uh, the, the, the best extracts were selected for further pur purification of photoactive pigment. And at the end of the project, we could obtain uh, an extract, which was still a mix of uh, pigments uh, that was 30 times uh, more active than the best drug on the market for phototherapy, for anti-cancer phototherapy. So the gold standard was MTHPC, which is a, a drug used in, a, in clinical. And as you can see, we obtain uh, some uh, very, very good uh, phototoxicity performance. So we have demonstrated the potential of marine microalgae for, for phototherapy and identified some uh, taxonomic groups that uh, have a high potential for uh, the, the clinical development of, uh, of uh, PS. And uh, last on this project, we could also demonstrate that the, the pigments were uptake by, up, uptaken by the cancer cells in, in the cytoplasm cytoplasm and we could also fractionate the the, the extract and uh, characterize all the, the pigments and the compounds uh, present in in the bioactive extract so um well this project uh, stopped because we had we had no more fund uh, and no more money to to go on and and the uh, development of uh, an anti-cancer drug is a long long uh, journey so starting from this uh, active uh, micro pigment we extended the biological evaluation to something which is uh, simpler for us uh, it's antibacterial phototherapy so for this uh, new project uh, we went on to working with uh, Ifromer, but also we, we have some new partners. So Professor Tan Sotea Hook and Professor Vincent Sol at the University of Limoges uh, in the southwest of uh, France. So the new project is called FASMA. FASMA is for uh, photo activable substances from marine algae. And the idea was to use this uh, extract to kill some bacteria. So we could demonstrate, so I will not give details on this project because we have a patent. We could demonstrate the antibacterial activity uh, in uh, bacterial strains involved in acne. Uh, also, the extract has an anti-inflammatory activity in keratinocytes, anti-lipogenic activity in keratinocytes, and a low toxicity. And also we could uh, demonstrate its antibiofilm activity on bacteria responsible for infection of wounds and also infections of, uh, of the skin. So uh, now at, at the moment we have a standardized extract which is uh, very easy to, to prepare and that we can incorporate into a dermocosmetic uh, uh, formulation. So the idea is to use this, uh, this cream to treat uh, acne and it is uh, highly efficient to kill Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus and also Cutibacterium acnes, which is uh, an anaerobic uh, strain uh, responsible for acne. So here is an example of what you, you can do. So in a case of moderate uh, acne, uh, you just uh, give a single session of uh, phototherapy and you can destroy the pathogenic bacteria. You can destroy the sebaceous glands. You can reduce the follicular uh, inflammation, obstruction, and the hyperkeratosis. And you can have a local immunosuppression. So this is very efficient. And this can replace some very toxic uh, treatment for acne. 
So at the moment, we have a patent. So it's the use of a polar e extract of this uh, microalgae for a photodynamic therapy. And we are discussing with industrial to develop uh, an anti-acne cream to develop uh, decontamination creams for wounds, especially for people who suffer from uh, di diabetic uh, food. Uh, also, we are in discussion with some uh, industrials that make some antibacterial cream for pets, and also with some uh, industrials, some companies that develop some plant bioremediation systems uh, to treat uh, phytopathogens. So the treatment could be using some uh, uh, sunlight, using some specific uh, dermocosmetic uh, lamp, or even uh, a, a personal use using your uh, cell phone light. So uh, it could be used by the, the patient to, to, to photo activate the, the extract. And uh, my colleagues at Limoges uh, are absolutely expert in the field of uh, photo, uh, phototherapy. And they have a high exper expertise in manufacturing some photo decontaminable fabrics for hospital and hygiene equipment. So particularly, they, they are interested in making some uh, photo-activable tissues, photo-activable masks, photo-activable laboratory coats and dressings, and even tissues that can be uh, photo-activated to, to clean and to remove bacteria, for example, in trains or in uh, metal. So uh, here is an example of what they are doing in uh, Limoges. As you can see here, they take uh, 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 three cationic uh, porphyrin and using some uh, click chemistry uh, reaction, they can graph the three cationic porphyrin onto uh, uh, cellulosic uh, fibers. So already they, they have obtained some uh, photoactivable paper, photoactivable uh, tissue. And uh, as you can see, the, the cellulose material is, uh, is uh, photoactivable uh, antibacterial uh, filter paper. Uh, also, they are working with targeting uh, the, the PS to bacterial membranes and to cell walls. So uh, they, are, they, they add the idea of grafting some uh, PS onto cellulose nanocrystals and at the same time grafting, for example, polymyxin B, which is a cationic antibiotic. Polymyxin B is able to to go uh, interact with a lipopolysaccharide in the external membrane of, of uh, gram-negative bacteria. So it's going to, to target the, the, the bacteria. So I will not go into the detail of, of this, but they, they managed to graph uh, on, uh, on cellulose nanocrystals uh, some uh, PS and also uh, polymyxin B and a, a mix of both of them. Um, and another uh, another approach that they are developing is to graft uh, PS on oligosaccharides, uh, for example, neutral porphyrin on oligosaccharides, and these oligosaccharides are able to target bacterial maltodextrin transporters in the membrane of, of bacteria. So this is a way to, to enter uh, the, the PS into the, the bacterial cell. Um, so this is another example of functionalized photosensitizer conjugate. As you can see, you can graph, for example, a hydrophilic fragment to improve the water solubility. Then you have the photoactive part, which can be used for phototherapy, but also for fluorescence imaging. Then you in introduce a linker, and you can target all this uh, PS system onto uh, tumor cells, for example. So you just have to, to add a ligand, a receptor ligand, to, to get a targeted delivery. Um, also, you can uh, introduce a molecular scaffold that will be activated by some enzymes, for example, in tumor cells. And that uh, will uh, allow the delivery of the PS into, into the, the tumor cell. Um, also, so they work too with some uh, covalent grafting of PS onto magnetic iron uh, nanoparticles. So these nanoparticles can be injected into the bloodstream. And usually when you have a tumor, 
the endothelial cells are, are relatively loose, so the nanoparticle can go into the tumor. It is called the EPR effect, enhanced permeability and retention. And then the tumor is going to concentrate the nanoparticle. So you can, uh, at the same time, photoactivate the PS and even at the same time uh, use the nanoparticle for phototherme to destroy the, the tumor. And uh, this will be my last example uh, before I talk about the plants. Uh, this is for me a really uh, amazing example. In this case, they use some gold nanoclusters that were functionalized. Uh, with some uh, peptide uh, linked to uh, PS, so to two PS. So one of the two PS was uh, quenched, and uh, they made some aggregates of nanocluster of, uh, of gold uh, particles. And then, sorry, they target the, the nanoparticle into, uh, in, into a tumor. So what's, what's happening now? The, 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 the nanocluster is going to bind a specific receptor. So you have uh, active targeting. Then it is, uh, um, it is internalized into the tumor cells. And then you have an enzyme trigger release of uh, the PS. So for example, this could be some catepsin or some uh, proteases expressed in, in tumor cell. So then you have the release of the three compounds. So the first one is a near infrared fluorescence emitting dye that can be used for imaging of the tumor. The second one is a precursor for a PS that will be used for phototherapy and destruction of the tumor cell. And the last one, the nanocluster, the gold nanocluster, can be used to induce some uh, thermal phototherapy to kill the, the tumor cell. So at the same time, you have everything in, in one nano uh, system. So uh, now I'm going to talk about plants because uh, you are all waiting for, for it. And uh, the, the question was, well, we, we were working for a very long time on plants, and now we have a kind of uh, good knowledge of uh, plant natural products. And the question is, are plants a relevant resource to discover some original uh, pho phototoxic compounds? So, of course, uh, we, we, many arguments are positive in this case. There is a species biodiversity, uh, the chemodiversity of plant natural products. Many species have been identified as phototoxic. Uh, there is also the possibility to grow some plants of pharmaceutical interest to produce the PS. And uh, also, only few uh, phototoxic plant molecules have been developed as PS. So in a first step, before starting exploring the, the biodiversity, we have decided to, to, to make a, a study. So pho phototoxicity is part of uh, the protection and response against plant predators and also plant pathogens. So here on this slide, I have uh, depicted all the the, the strategies that plants uh, uh, develop to, to fight uh, predators and, and, uh, and uh, pathogens. So, for example, having spine is a good way to fight predators. But if you have a fungal infection or if you have a bacterial infection, then it will not be so, so efficient. Uh, yes, the same for predation. If you eat uh, your predator, it's okay, but uh, it's it's not really uh, uh, useful when, when you have a fungal infection. But if a, a fungus or a bacteria attacks the plant and then if there's a phototoxic compound in it, then it, it will be very efficient. Uh, so, um, also, there is another uh, argument. Uh, numerous, numerous cases of phototoxicity have been uh, documented in farm animals, so in the world, and particularly in Brazil. And it is estimated that, that maybe 10 to 15% of farm animals die from uh, plant poisoning, including uh, phototoxicity. Uh, and particularly in Brazil, it is estimated that uh, about 1 million uh, cattle die each year from plant poisoning. So uh, we, we, we thought that there was something interesting to, to go on. So the question were, how many plants are phototoxic in the world? And uh, what is the percentage according to the global uh, biodiversity? 
which are the taxonomic families of interest to, to identify some photo, phototoxic compounds? Uh, where can we find these uh, plants in uh, which biome and uh, ecosystem? And uh, is it a convergent evolutionary process in terms of chemical ecology? So is it linked to predation by insect, infection by pathogens, and so on? And our goal was to update the list of uh, world phototoxic plants, but also to update the list of uh, phototoxic molecules. And last, uh, we, we have decided to evaluate the potential of Brazilian plants as a source of photo phototoxic compounds. So, uh, in fact, we needed a, 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 a team a, 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 team of shock to, to do that. So um, we recruited uh, three uh, highly motivated master students, Raphael, Mathieu, and Jonathan, and they made a very, very uh, great job. And, um, and in particular during a COVID time, so it was not so, so easy to work and, and they really made a great, great job. And also, of course, we needed some chemists. So we recruited my colleague, Professor Valérie Thierry and Professor Raphael Grenier. So I, I'd like to ask you if you have a photo of him uh, without the sunglasses. I would be uh, very pleased to, to get it. Also, we needed some uh, experts in uh, Brazilian plants. So we recruited uh, my, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Raimundo Gonçalves de Oliveira Jr. and uh, my, my Brazilian brother, Professor Jackson Guedes da Silva Almeida, and we needed some uh, phototherapy experts. So we, we recruited Vincent and Tan from the University of Limoges. Okay, so we carried out a systematic review, a literature search, uh, using five uh, specialized databases. So you all know these this databases. And uh, the keywords that we used were natural product, natural molecule, plant, uh, photosensitizer, photosensitization, phototoxicity, and Brazil. And uh, finally, we got 90 publications and one book chapter. And, and also one book chapter in Chinese that uh, we, could, we couldn't read. Uh, so we selected only publication in English. Uh, we also excluded publication dealing with uh, photoprotective uh, natural products. And uh, also we found some uh, publication dealing with the use, the traditional use of uh, phototoxic plants in, uh, in, in uh, but this, this these were not uh, really uh, useful for our, for our study. Uh, also, we checked the, the chemical structure of all phototoxic compounds, uh, so it was checked independently by four chemists. And also, we were very um, uh, attentive to the taxonomic classification of the plants that was uh, double checked. So, what are the results of this uh, preliminary study? So, the first question: How many land plants on Earth? Uh, so we could find that uh, there are 435,000 species of plants on, on Earth. Uh, so maybe, as you know, there are some marine plants too, but we exclude, excluded them from the, the study. So there are two big uh, subgroups. The first one is vascular plants, including angiosperm, gymnosperm, uh, ferns, and uh, lycophytes. And the second subgroup is non-vascular seedless plants, including mosses, onwards and liverwort. Okay, so uh, we, we, we focus on these two subgroup. And uh, also we wonder how many flowering plant species are discovered every year by botanists. So um, by uh, reading several uh, paper, we could uh, lead to about 2000 species are discovered every year. And uh, among this, uh, among these uh, three, uh, these 435,000 species, how many species are uh, reported for phototoxicity or containing phototoxic natural product? And the answer is only 229. So less than 0.08% of world species. That means less than one species over 1,000 is phototoxic. So this is really interesting. No bryophyte, no fern, no lycophyte has been reported or even 
studied, we don't really know, for a phototoxicity uh, potential. And some reports exist in few lichens and uh, superior mushrooms, basidiomycet, but we excluded them from the study because we wanted to talk about uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms. Okay, so as a result, we updated the list of all world phototoxic plants. So as you can see, they were all classified according to their family, the name of the species, the, the vernacular name, the, the location where they were observed, uh, and the phototoxic compounds that you can find in, in these plants, the chemical class of the phototoxic compound, so the bibliographic reference. And here you have a link you can go to visit, and I will show you, you will find some information on the plant and on, on a map with this is biogeographical distribution. So we made this work for Fabaceae, Apiaceae, Rutaceae, all, all family. Okay, and as you can see in, uh, for example, in Rutaceae, you, you can have some uh, species that contain uh, different uh, uh, chemical compounds like alkaloids, furanocumarines, and so they, 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 this is really a, a, an evolutive strategy to, to fight against predators and, and uh, infection for, for them. Okay, so if you click to the, the link, this one, you get a map with a biogeographical distribution, and uh, you can have access to some uh, photos of, the, of, of, of the, the plant. So here is another example for uh, Rutaceae, right? And then, of course, uh, we made the, the, the opposite work. So uh, after that, we, we decided to work with the molecules. So uh, the conclusion on, the, on this part is that uh, uh, only a limited number of species contain phototoxic compounds, but they can be found among a wide diversity of plant families in various biomes of the world, so cold, temperate, tropical, subtropical, and so on. And uh, so uh, probably uh, this is a relatively rare evolutionary strategy in plants, but it can be observed in most ecoregions of the world and in a wide variety of taxonomic families. And uh, we have identified, of course, the families that are of particular interest to, uh, to, to find some phototoxic uh, compounds. Um, so in a second step for each molecule, phototoxic molecules, we have defined its molecular formula the chemical family, the chemical structure, and in which plants you can find it and where these plants were observed in the world. And uh, also we gave additional details when we could find some, for example, the location of the molecule in the plant. Is it in the leaf? Is it uh, in the root? And, and so on, and the bibliographic uh, reference. So we could classify all phototoxic molecules into 10 major uh, chemical families, including alkaloids, anthracinones, phenolics and flavonoids, carotenoids, cumarine, lectins, naphthodiantron, por porphyrin and derivatives, saponins and terpenes. Um, then we uh, made a focus on Brazilian biodiversity. So as you know, um, botanists estimate that 55,000 plant species are endemic to Brazil. And uh, of course, uh, there's a, a high uh, biodiversity, chemodiversity. And uh, in Brazil, you have six biomes. So you, you know that very well. Uh, Mata, Atlantica, Amazonia, Pampa, Pantanal, Cerrado, and Catinga, uh, where, where, where uh, Professor Jackson is, is located. So uh, for each plant that was described in Brazil, uh, uh, we, we have a new table, including its family, the name of the plant, the uh, presence in the six different biomes uh, when, when it was uh, shown, when it was observed in, in the biomes, the name of the molecule you can find in them, and the biogeographical uh, location. For example, for this plant, you can find in it uh, protodiocin, which is a steroidal uh, saponin, and you can have access to the place where it was, it was observed in, in Brazil. 
Okay. And we could also build a taxonomic tree highlighting the families of uh, Brazilian plants that are re reported as phototoxic. So, for example, if you look at Fabaceae, you can see that uh, 18 species are phototoxic in Fabaceae. And uh, so the, the species of interest are mostly Poaceae, Apiaceae, Fabaceae, and Rutaceae. So that means that if you want to find some uh, phototoxic compounds, of course, you, you have a lot of chance to go uh, studying some uh, original uh, species uh, uh, that belong to, to this uh, family. But also, as you can see, all family contain some species that are phototoxic. So that means that, in fact, there is a high potential to find some phot phototoxic compounds in Brazil. And uh, so this, this is an example of selected compound and selected plant uh, for each biome uh, of uh, Brazil. Uh, so this was also to highlight the chemical diversity of phototoxic compound. And um, so in Brazil, uh, we found that 106 plants uh, are phototoxic. Uh, and 30 of which contain unknown phototoxic molecules. So they have been reported for phototoxicity, but we don't know what is uh, the, the, the molecule responsible for this phototoxicity. And these species represent about half of all world's phototoxic plants. So that means that 46% of all world phototoxic plants can be found in Brazil. So this is highly interesting. Uh, many of these species are common, quite easy to cultivate, and that means that uh, maybe it could be interesting to develop the, the, the culture of these uh, plants and to produce some uh, PS. Uh, it could be uh, economically a viable uh, strategy. And also, uh, of course, given the great taxonomic diversity of phototoxic plants already identified, it is sure that uh, many, many species remain to be, to be uh, studied to, to find some original phototoxic compound. So now I will make a concluding remark on the whole study. The idea was to unify some information from the literature and uh, to have an idea of the ability of plants to produce a natural phototoxic compound. Uh, also, uh, the review will present an updated uh, discussion on the use of PS for phototherapy and development of a photoactivable device. Uh, so, as we, I just told you, uh, phototoxicity is not so common in a vascular plant. So, probably this is a uh, strategy that remains relatively rare for plants, although it can be observed in most ecoregion of the world and in many uh, taxonomic families. So probably this highlights a convergent evolutionary strategy uh, to combat predation and infection. And one of the main results was uh, the interest of Brazil to, to, to find some phototoxic uh, species. And of course, now we want to go further uh, because we want to, to, to screen and to find some uh, new uh, phototoxic compound. So what we plan now is to publish the paper because the review is not uh, published yet. And uh, we would like to, uh, to obtain some funding to carry out a big Franco-Brazilian project that could involve several uh, uh, partners in uh, pharmacognosy, chemistry, bacteriology, virology, and so the idea would be to the idea would be to to, to study the Brazilian plants and maybe algae for uh, the development of new uh, PS, and also to 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 develop innovative uh, strategies to, to functionalize uh, the, the, the PS and to target the, the PS. Okay, so to, to, to finish, I'd like to thank again my, my colleagues at UNIVASP and my, my Brazilian brother, you know, Professor Jackson, Roberto Guedes da Silva Almeida. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate to, to the symposium. And uh, thanks to the organizing committee of the event. I'd like to thank also the researchers involved in the project and the funders of the, of the project. 
So thank you for your attention. Of course, uh, the discussion is open if you have any, any question or any comment or idea. Hello, congratulations for the excellent lecture, excellent work. You are a, a big science. <laughs> Uh, we have some comments from Professor Emmanuel Costa. Excellent work. Thank you. And in case of DTERPEN, the negative mode is more informative. Okay. okay. <laughs> I note. <laughs> Luis, amazing lecture. We have one question from Raimundo. How will you screen for molecules with photosensitizing potential? In vitro assay using culture cells, is it reproduce, reproducible and comparable <coughs> to in vitro effects? So um, this is a, a very interesting, uh, relevant question because we we need to to be able to screen for extract and uh, and also uh, purified compounds. And at the moment, we were mostly involved in uh, purification of compounds, but all the phototoxicity assays were made uh, at our colleagues' lab, uh, so in uh, Nantes and in uh, Limoges. And at the moment. Uh, we just got money to buy a system that we can use uh, with uh, cancer cell culture. So the idea is to um, to send some light in uh, micro plates where we will uh, grow some uh, cell uh, cancer cells, and uh, so we will use a standard uh, photosensitizer, which is uh, MTHPC, and with this system we can select the wavelength, we can uh, irradiate, photo activate, uh, extract uh, in, in uh, 96 uh, microplates. So it's, it's quite easy to screen for, for uh, the, the biological uh, activity of the extract. Uh, so this is complementary of the assays that are made in Limoges, because in Limoges, they, they work with, with uh, bacteria uh, uh, photo, photo therapy, antibacterial phototherapy. So they usually they work with uh, bacterial biofilm, also bacterial uh, culture in, uh, in uh, petri dishes. And uh, in fact, not so many labs in uh, France uh, are able to screen for uh, phototoxicity photo of uh, plant uh, IG. So is it reproducible? Well, I mean, we have to, to check it. Uh, we have to find the good uh, standard for uh, positive and negative uh, control. And comparable to in vivo effects, uh, well, We have okay. to que estamos tendo probleminha aqui com a rede. Laurent, go working with this purify compound if you want to go in vivo. Tivemos um probleminha aqui, que a internet lá. Vamos aguardar um pouquinho aqui para ver que ele volta. Enquanto isso, pessoal, aproveitar aqui para comunicar que amanhã a, as atividades né, é, iniciam à tarde, mas a partir das 13 horas, tá certo? Então, nós vamos ter uma palestra né, do, do professor da Índia, né, e devido à questão do fuso horário, então, nós vamos iniciar às 13 horas da tarde, né, a primeira palestra. Então, já coloquem aí na agenda de vocês, se programem, para que a gente possa iniciar as atividades né, pontualmente às 13 horas. Tá bom? Então, divulguem aí para os seus colegas. A gente vai divulgar também 
nas nossas redes sociais, né, para que a gente possa fechar amanhã com chave de ouro, né, o quarto dia do nosso evento. Então, vamos aguardar mais um pouco aqui, ver se o Lobon volta. Ele teve um probleminha de conexão, mas está tentando voltar, certo? Vamos aguardar aqui. Já temos um tempinho. Se alguém tiver mais alguma pergunta, algum comentário, já coloca aqui enquanto ele está voltando. Pronto. Oh, sorry, my, my home is not uh, hyper connected, you know. Uh, yes, so, so I mean, for, for the, the, the individual space, we, we, we really need to find a good uh, candidate and to, to study the pharmacokinetics in uh, animal models. But it, it could be very interesting to, to target um, uh, what I have shown. I mean, a mix of uh, photosensitizer and also targeting uh, tumors and also the possible use for uh, targeted delivery of the, of the compound. Uh, so it will be the, the next step. OK. Comentário aqui para o Hugo, palestra anterior. Vou colocar aqui rapidinho para que ele possa ler yeah, ainda. So, uh, the, the, the... Ah, com... Comentário de Hugo. Lohan, tá ouvindo? E caiu de novo a conexão. Raimundo, tá tentando falar com ele? Tô, tô falando com ele aqui. Provavelmente deve ter caído. Caiu novamente. Uhum. Deixa eu sair e voltar para ele responder essa de Hugo. E aí a gente passa para a próxima. Pronto, então, já o próximo palestrante já está aqui. Então, qualquer coisinha a gente já inicia. José Xavier, da Agilent, já prepara aí sua apresentação. Já deixa no ponto. Então, o Lohan voltou aqui. Caiu novamente. Aproveito para avisar o pessoal. Ah, ele voltou aqui. Vamos finalizar aqui logo. É só um minuto. Ué. Voltamos. Oh, sorry, I was disconnected. Uh, yes. <laughs> Voltamos. So, so yes, uh, usually... Uh, for the cleaning of uh, the, the phototoxic extract, uh, we can, for example, measure the production of uh, reactive oxygen species directly in, in, the, in the cell culture medium. So it's not uh, easy to do, but uh, some, uh, some dosage uh, techniques exist for that. And also we can, uh, we can monitor the, the Production of uh, reactive. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Tá ouvindo, Lohan? Está ouvindo? Estamos com outro problema. Lohan? Acho 
que a gente pode fazer o seguinte, a gente pode começar a próxima palestra e qualquer comentário, qualquer pergunta, a gente deixa aqui para o final, ele vai continuar na sala. Pode ser, Raimundo? Pode, podemos continuar? Pronto, acabei de mandar uma mensagem aqui para ele. Acho que a gente pode continuar para não atrasar, né? E aí, no final, é. ele retorna. Aí ele retorna e a gente coloca aqui as perguntas para a discussão. Perfeito. Tá certo? Então, já vamos colocar aqui na, na tela o José Xavier, da Aslen, é, que vai ministrar aqui a palestra. Deixa eu ver o título aqui. Está aqui no outro arquivo. É, sistemas LCMS de alta resolução para confirmação de identidade e elucidação estrutural de compostos conhecidos, características de hardware e ferramentas de software. Então, também, Xavier, em nome da comissão organizadora do evento, nós agradecemos né, a Agile por mais uma vez estar prestigiando o nosso evento. Né, em 2019, vocês estiveram aqui presencialmente, né, o Rodrigo, a equipe... Certo? Então, mais uma vez, obrigado aí por estarem participando. Tá bom? Então, fique à vontade para colocar sua apresentação. Ok. Deixa eu puxar aqui, então, minha, minha tela. Aí me diz, professor, se vocês estão vendo bem aí, se tá, estão me ouvindo bem, se estão vendo bem. Ah, a o, luz, som, o som está bom, o som está tá ótimo. E estão vendo a tela? Com Ainda a não. Eu já pedi para compartilhar. Espera aí, deixa eu ver aqui. Deixa eu compartilhar. Share screen, né? Perfeito. Vamos lá. Vamos botar aqui na apresentação. Assim que se vocês estiverem vendo, me falam, ok? Pronto, tá. Aí tá clica. Vendo? Pronto, isso. Já está aparecendo, então vou sair aqui. Perfeito, então, muito obrigado, professor Jackson, é, a gente que agradece o convite, né, para participar desse evento, e como o senhor comentou, né, o objetivo aqui é falar sobre sistemas LCMS de alta resolução, já deixar bem claro de antemão que ela é uma, é, é, o meu objetivo aqui é fazer uma palestra técnica e não comercial, e vou tentar linkar o tempo todo aqui, obviamente, o uso dessas ferramentas e as características dessas ferramentas para análise de produtos naturais. Obviamente, a palestra anterior eu estive assistindo, né, a palestra do, do professor Lohan, e muito, muita coisa ali que ele apresentou e muitas perguntas ali podem ser respondidas e são respondidas por sistemas LCMS. Então, aqui vocês, o objetivo dessa apresentação é justamente trazer para vocês... É, essas características dos sistemas, né? Porque dentro da família de LCMS nós temos muitos modelos diferentes, então qual é aquele mais adequado para uma abordagem de análise de produtos naturais? Por que, que ele é o mais adequado? E ao final eu vou passar um pouco das, uh, de alguns exemplos. Né? Então o objetivo hoje dessa apresentação é justamente esse. Só me apresentar de forma um pouco mais formal, né? Meu nome é José Xavier e eu trabalho como especialista de produto em LCMS para a Agnet, tá? Sou formado em farmácia pela Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. Estou falando diretamente aqui do, do Sul, né? O calor que vocês estão passando aqui, aqui nós não estamos, aqui está frio, né? Estou falando aqui de Florianópolis. É, só para colocar um pouco do contexto, né? Sou, tenho mestrado na área de análise de alimentos por LCMS. Vou colocar um pouco do meu currículo aqui para deixar bem posicionado para todos. Então, nós vamos cobrir nessa apresentação os benefícios da espectrometria de massas. Então, por que, que a espectrometria de massas é uma ferramenta? E eu já vou abrir aqui um grande parênteses, né? Para essas abordagens de análise de produtos naturais, invariavelmente, em algum momento da pesquisa de vocês, vocês vão ter que usar a espectrometria de massas. Em quase 100% dos casos. Tá? Vocês vão entender o porquê durante a apresentação. Depois eu vou falar para vocês como o aspecto da minha apresentação ela é técnica, né? Eu quero trazer um pouco do aspecto técnico para que vocês tenham um entendimento dessa tecnologia, dessa plataforma. Eu vou falar um pouco da configuração básica do sistema LCMS, o que vocês precisam ter dentro de um laboratório, a configuração mínima para que vocês tenham um LCMS rodando, né? Para poder fazer as análises de vocês. Então, os, 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 os itens ali que compõem uma configuração de um sistema desse. Depois eu vou falar das características de hardware, mais especificamente para sistemas de alta resolução, o que eles têm 
que trazem de o que podem trazer de informações para vocês aí na, na no, no universo das pesquisas das análises de vocês algumas funcionalidades de software que são características extremamente importantes porque uh, o hardware ele vai adquirir o dado e o software ele vai processar o dado então quais as características de software né que é onde a mágica realmente acontece aonde vocês têm as perguntas de vocês respondidas né e ao final eu vou falar um pouco de alguns exemplos de aplicações em análise de produtos naturais, onde a ferramenta de LCMS, no caso o QTOF, né, dos sistemas de alta resolução, tem uma grande importância, né, tem um grande impacto positivo. É, eu poderia fazer... Essa, essa apresentação ela pode levar 40 minutos, duas horas, quatro horas, né, como a gente tem aqui um tempo de 40 minutos, eu vou tentar trazer para vocês todos esses itens que eu passei aqui, da melhor forma possível, mas obviamente que não vai ser possível se aprofundar em todos eles. Então, eu deixo aqui também aberto o meu contato, no final eu vou deixar meu e-mail, caso vocês tenham dúvidas específicas ou, 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 ou precise de algum material adicional, vocês entrem em contato que eu, vou, que eu fico disponível para compartilhar com vocês, tá? Então, por que, que a espectrometria de massas, ela é um sonho de consumo de 10, entre 10 laboratórios de pesquisa. O que, que ela tem de tão interessante e por que ela é tão importante para as análises de produtos naturais? Primeira característica é que ela é considerada uma técnica de detecção universal. Ela detecta as moléculas baseadas na sua relação massa-carga. Quando vocês estão trabalhando com produtos naturais, vocês trabalham com uma variedade enorme de moléculas em uma variedade enorme de matrizes. Né? As amostras de vocês, de plantas, seja do caule, do, da, da folha, da raiz... É... É muita, vocês têm muita variedade. Então, vocês têm muitas características das moléculas que, eventualmente, se vocês tiverem um detector ótico, por exemplo, ou um detector de fluorescência, vocês, eventualmente, não vão conseguir detectar todas as moléculas presentes naquela amostra. Justamente porque algumas moléculas têm fluorescência, algumas não. Algumas moléculas absorvem determinados comprimentos de onda. Quando eu trabalho com espectrometria de massas, todas essas características eu posso eliminar. Basta que a molécula tenha massa, e obviamente toda molécula tem massa, e seja passiva de ser ionizada, ela pode ser detectada, então, por um espectrômetro de massas. Por isso que a técnica, ela é tão uh, desejada, porque basicamente vocês podem pegar ali qualquer amostra, eu vi ali um, um slide do professor Lohan, e eu vou pedir licença para usar como referência o que ele estava apresentando, é, algumas moléculas é, e onde, em que plantas elas são encontradas. Esse é um, um, um exemplo clássico do uso da espectrometria de massas. Eu vi alguns é, fotossensibilizantes, se eu não me engano, eram as moléculas de interesse dele. É justamente para isso, uma da, um, dos, um dos aspectos que a espectrometria de massas é utilizada. Identificar essas moléculas, em que matriz elas estão, se elas estão naquela folha, se elas estão naquele caule. Então, isso é uma característica e uma funcionalidade da técnica. Ela é um, é, é, são sistemas de alta seletividade e alta, alta sensibilidade, o que é bem interessante para análises quantitativas. Então, se vocês estão fazendo um estudo de produtos naturais e vocês precisam quantificar, e às vezes aquela molécula, aquele composto, ele está numa quantidade muito baixa, a espectrometria de massas tem sensibilidade para encontrar essas moléculas em níveis de parte por trilhão, parte por bilhão, por exemplo. Então, em baixíssimas concentrações, a técnica é capaz de detectar. E a alta seletividade faz com que vocês não tenham resultados falso positivos ou falso negativos. Vocês estão detectando uma molécula ali, achando que é aquele ativo de interesse de vocês naquela planta, quando na verdade é um interferente. Então, quando a gente trabalha com espectrometria de massas, esse risco ele é reduzido e muito. Tá? Além disso, o sistema de LCMS ele traz várias informações ortogonais que facilitam que com vocês tenham identificações e elucidações estruturais com alta precisão, tá? E outras características que são bem interessantes, o preparo de amostra, quando a gente trabalha com LCMS, ele é bem simplificado, então reduz o uso de solventes agressivos, sejam agressivos para o meio ambiente, sejam agressivos para o analista que está operando ali, né, que está realizando as análises, e também reduz o custo do laboratório, porque os métodos por, 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 pelo sistema de espectrometria de massa ser altamente seletivo, sensível e possibilitar a agregar informações ortogonais fazem com que o preparo de amostra também seja simplificado. E outra característica é a alta velocidade. Então, vocês conseguem, com o um espectrômetro de massas, detectar várias e várias amostras por dia, porque ele, essas características que eu, que, eu, que eu citei anteriormente fazem com que nós possamos ter corridas cromatográficas muito curtas, porque eu posso me dar o luxo de ter um fenômeno chamado coiluição que é um fenômeno indesejado ou difícil de contornar quando eu estou trabalhando com detectores óticos, como, por exemplo, fluorescência ou, ou DAD, ou detectores de UV. 
ok? É, esse é um, isso aqui é um overview de como, de, de, do que vocês precisam para ter um LCMS instalado no laboratório de vocês, de forma bem básica, tá? Vocês precisam de um sistema de introdução de amostra, que pode ser um cromatógrafo líquido, né? No caso, obviamente, aqui nós estamos falando de cromatografia líquida acoplada à espectrometria de massas, por isso a sigla LCMS, o LC vem de cromatografia líquida. E aqui eu tenho condições de separar minhas moléculas e gerar picos cromatográficos para suas posteriores uh, integrações e quantificações, por exemplo. E eu posso introduzir minha amostra através de sistemas de infusão. Quando eu tenho uma amostra ali, por exemplo, de uma planta, e eu quero ter uma noção inicial de que compostos estão presentes ali. Então, é uma análise qualitativa rápida. Eu posso fazer tra através de infusão. Eu preciso ter fontes de ionização para evaporar o solvente que vem da, da, do, do, da, da, do, meu, do meu sistema de introdução líquida, porque eu preciso das minhas moléculas no estado gasoso. Então, isso eu realizo na fonte de ionização. E aqui também gero carga na molécula. Depois, eu levo minhas moléculas para o analisador de massas. Elas se chocam contra um detector. E eu uso ferramentas, então... De, 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 de processamento de, de, de dados, né? ferramentas de software, para extrair daqueles dados as informações que realmente são relevantes para mim. Tudo fica ligado num gerador de nitrogênio, porque o gerador é o nitrogênio que vai evaporar o solvente aqui na fonte de ionização, e ligado num no-break para proteger o sistema de quedas bruscas de luz, de energia. Tá? E quando a gente trabalha com espectrometria de massas, três informações são as mais básicas e extremamente importantes. Essas informações, esses conceitos que eu vou passar agora vão ser importantes para o decorrer da apresentação e é importante que vocês tenham isso uh, o máximo possível fixado aí no conhecimento de vocês. A informação mais básica e, e que eu consigo num espectrômetro de massas é o que nós chamamos de espectro de MS, que é uma varredura da minha amostra. O que, que eu estou representando nesse slide? Eu falei para o espectrômetro de massas o seguinte, eu quero que tu mostre para mim todas as moléculas presentes nessa amostra entre 350 e 1.000 Daltons. Então, cada linha dessa é uma molécula e esse número em cima é a massa dessa molécula. Então, isso aqui é a impressão digital da amostra. Então, se vocês estão, por exemplo, analisando um caju, uma, uma, sei lá, uma, uma, uma folha de caju, e aquela folha de caju tem algum tipo de flavonoide, por exemplo, que interessa para vocês, vocês conseguem ver, nesse primeiro momento, se esse flavonoide está presente e a e, e qual a intensidade da presença desse flavonoide? Se vocês estão comparando, por exemplo, esse caju, essa folha de caju, numa idade, é, é, por exemplo, numa época do ano, no verão, por exemplo, pode ser que esse composto de interesse esteja sendo expresso numa quantidade menor do que, do, do, do que quando esse, essa folha, por exemplo, foi coletada no, no inverno ou no verão, fazendo comparações em situações de exposição diferentes para essa planta. Tá? Então, esse espectro de MS dá para vocês esse tipo de informação. Agora, se vocês querem pegar uma molécula dessa e ter um entendimento mais profundo dessa molécula, vocês podem ter o que nós chamamos de espectro de MS-MS, que é quando eu pego uma molécula, por exemplo, e fragmento ela em, determ... em diferentes pedaços para que eu tenha uma impressão digital da molécula agora. Então, eu estou, por exemplo, fazendo um estudo de uma planta e eu, ide... eu identifico que tem uma molécula lá diferente, interessante, que eu quero aprofundar o meu estudo em cima dessa molécula. A primeira coisa que eu vou fazer é fragmentar essa molécula para entender o perfil de fragmentação dela. E com esse perfil de fragmentação é possível montar a estrutura dessa molécula ou ter uma identificação positiva, porque, por exemplo, nesse caso aqui, eu posso ter várias moléculas de massa 244 na minha matriz, por exemplo, de uma planta. Só que só essa molécula aqui vai gerar esse perfil de fragmentação específico. Aqui, só para vocês entenderem, cada linha dessa é uma molécula, né, um fragmento, né, e a, o número em cima é a massa desse fragmento. Todos esses fragmentos aqui, é, exemplificados, são provenientes da molécula de massa 244. E a última informação, e não menos importante, é o cromatograma, que são os picos cromatográficos das moléculas que estão presentes na minha matriz, na minha amostra. Então, aqui eu consigo ter uma possibilidade de medir a área desse pico e quantificar essa molécula. Então, por exemplo, eu estou analisando uma antocianina num determinado composto. Eu consigo visualizar o tempo de retenção dessa antocianina, calcular a área dela e quantificar, é, é, dizer quantos, é, quantas partes por bilhão ou quantos miligramas por quilo ou quantos microgramas por quilo dessa molécula eu tenho dentro dessa minha matriz de estudo, ok? Falando um pouco da técnica, da instrumentação propriamente dita, então, quando eu trabalho com LCMS, eu preciso daquela fonte de ionização 
que é o que vai reger aqueles dois fenômenos essenciais, que é evaporar o solvente e ionizar a molécula, tá? Então, eu tenho três técnicas de ionização fundamentais ou clássicas, que é a ionização por eletrospray, a ionização por APCI e a ionização por APPI. Elas diferenciam-se entre si na capacidade de gerar carga, de gerar íons, para algumas moléculas de acordo com suas características, tanto de polaridade quanto de massa. Então, quanto mais polar for as moléculas, melhor ionizada ela é por eletrospray. Quanto mais apolar for a molécula, melhor ela é ionizada ou por APCI ou por APPI. Então, quando vocês trabalham com produtos naturais, a variedade... Às vezes eu estou procurando um hormônio de uma planta, por exemplo. É uma molécula um pouco mais apolar. Eventualmente, eu vou ter que usar fontes de ionização mais adequadas para essa característica dessa molécula. Ah, eu estou analisando proteínas em uma planta. São moléculas mais polares. Então, a eletrospray é melhor utilizada, é mais eficiente. Então, a decisão pela fonte de ionização está diretamente relacionada com características da molécula que vocês estão buscando analisar, tá? E quando a gente fala em sistemas LCMS, existem quatro famílias principais. Tem os sistemas LCMS single quadrupolo, os sistemas LCMS triplo quadrupolo, os sistemas LCMS TOFs e os LCMS QTOFs. O foco da apresentação hoje são os sistemas LCMS QTOFs. Esses outros sistemas podem ser utilizados para análise de produtos naturais? Sim, mas eles têm mais limitações quando a gente faz trabalhos de investigação e de elucidação estrutural, aquele, traba aquele, aquele trabalho de pesquisa pura mesmo, aquela pesquisa avançada, sem dúvida nenhuma, os sistemas QTOFs são mais eficientes e vocês vão ver adiante o porquê, tá? Quando a gente trabalha com LCMS QTOF e a gente está trabalhando em produtos naturais, eu tenho três abordagens clássicas, tá? A abordagem Target que é quando eu já sei que moléculas eu estou procurando naquela planta, por exemplo, né? Então, eu já sei quem eu quero... De, por exemplo, o professor Lohan fazendo mais, pedindo licença aqui novamente, fazendo uma referência ao que ele falou. É, ele estava falando de algumas moléculas e em que plantas elas são encontradas. Aquilo é uma análise target. Eu já sei que moléculas eu estou procurando. Eu pego ali 100 tipos de amostras, 100 tipos de plantas diferentes e procuro em todas essas plantas se aquelas moléculas estão presentes. Isso é o que nós chamamos de análise target. Nós temos as abordagens não target, que é aquela abordagem onde eu quero ver tudo o que tem naquela planta, por exemplo. O meu, meu, o meu LC massa, lembrando sempre, o LC, o espectrômetro de massas, ele sempre vai dar para vocês leitura de massas, das massas dos compostos. Então, eu vou ler todas as moléculas que estão presentes naquela amostra. Por exemplo, eu peguei uma folha uh, do coqueiro e joguei ali, extraí, fiz uma extração, injetei no meu, no meu LC massa. Meu LC massa vai detectar todas as moléculas dentro de uma faixa que eu determino para ele. E eu vou jogar todas essas, 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 essas moléculas encontradas contra um banco de dados, uma referência, e o banco de dados vai me devolver a identificação desses compostos. Então, é uma análise não target. Eu estou querendo ver todo mundo ali dentro. E uma terceira abordagem, e é aquela abordagem mais fascinante do estudo de produtos naturais, e eu acho que tem bastante... A gente, como, com, a, com a flora tão rica que nós temos no Brasil, eu acho que é um potencial enorme de pesquisa, que é a descoberta de moléculas desconhecidas, que ninguém ainda identificou. Uh, que aqui, no caso, o LC que o TOF, ele vai te dar ferramentas para tu identificar a estrutura daquela molécula e, eventualmente, uh, uh, descobrir uma molécula nova. E, obviamente, depois tem que ser feito todos os testes, né, da, da, da atividade biológica, da aplicabilidade dessa molécula, mas o LC que o TOF, ele vai trazer para te identificar, ou vai te ajudar a ir muito longe no processo de identificação dessa molécula, ok? Então, essas são as três abordagens clássicas. E quais são as características dos QTOFs que fazem com que ele seja tão eficiente para essas abordagens que eu comentei anteriormente? São três características que vocês vão entender por que elas são tão importantes e qual o impacto delas em uma, em uma análise de produtos naturais. Tá? Primeira característica, poder de resolução. Segunda característica, capacidade de medir as moléculas com alta exatidão de massas. E terceira característica, a distribuição isotópica. Tá? O que, que é resolução? É a capacidade que o meu QTOF tem de ler moléculas que têm massas muito próximas como sendo uh, compostos individuais. Aqui ao lado direito da tela, vocês conseguem ver uma detecção por QTOF. Vejam que eu tenho duas moléculas, uma de massa 613.9646 e uma molécula de massa 614.9675. Vejam quantas moléculas com menos de um Dalton de diferença eu conseguiria colocar 
nesse espaço. Então, isso é a capacidade de resolução do instrumento. Quando eu trabalho com amostras como as que vocês trabalham, produtos naturais, é, eu tenho moléculas, amostras muito complexas. Eu tenho um universo de moléculas ali dentro das mais diferentes massas. Se o meu instrumento não é capaz de diferenciar cada uma delas, eu posso identificar uma molécula uh, de um interferente achando que é a minha molécula, o meu ativo de interesse. Tá? Então, essa capacidade de resolução é uma característica importante. Outra, outra característica é a exatidão de massas. Quanto mais exato o teu sistema consegue medir uma massa, maior é a tua capacidade de identificar esse composto ou então de uh, identificar, caso ele, seja, uh, caso ele seja um composto que tu queira, queira buscar a referência dele dentro de uma biblioteca ou, ou então uh, a, a alta exatidão te propicia fazer uma identificação de um composto desconhecido, por exemplo. Tá? Basicamente, o que é a exatidão de massas? Ela é medida em ppm e é a comparação da massa medida com a massa teórica. Toda vez que eu consigo, uh, toda vez que eu gero uma detecção em um instrumento de alta exatidão, eu posso atribuir a essa massa medida uma fórmula molecular. Quando eu pego essa fórmula molecular proposta e calculo a massa é, exata dela teórica, eu comparo a massa medida com a massa teórica. Quanto menor for essa diferença entre as duas, maior é a exatidão de massa da minha detecção. E quanto menor o valor desse ppm maior é a exatidão de massas. Então, sempre façam essa, 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 essa visualização uh, uh, de inversamente proporcional. Quanto menor o valor de ppm, maior é a exatidão de massas. Tá? Basicamente, para vocês entenderem como é que eu chego nesse valor aqui de ppm, eu faço uma, um, um, aplico uma fórmula. A massa medida menos a massa calculada vezes 1 milhão dividido pela massa calculada. E eu vou ter, então, a diferença delas em ppm. Tá? A exatidão de massas também permite que eu atribua fórmulas moleculares a uma massa medida. Aqui, por exemplo, se eu medir uma molécula com baixa exatidão de massa e a medida dessa molécula me der 28 daltons, eu tenho vários candidatos de fórmula molecular que podem ser atribuídas a essa massa. Quando eu trabalho com alta exatidão de massa, até 4, 5 casas depois da vírgula, para cada massa exata dessa medida, eu vou ter um número, ou vou ter só uma fórmula molecular, ou um número muito limitado de, 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 de alternativas ou de opções de fórmula molecular. Tá? Então, essa é uma outra característica que, quando eu estou trabalhando na descoberta de um novo composto, a hora que eu meço aquela molécula dentro da minha planta, da minha raiz, do meu caule, eu tenho a medida daquela massa de forma bastante exata, eu consigo atribuir uma fórmula molecular a ela. E eu começo, então, a desvendar, eu começo o meu trabalho de identificação desse composto. Tá? E outra característica importante é a distribuição isotópica. A distribuição isotópica, aqui nesse exemplo que eu estou mostrando, são, é a mesma molécula, tá? Vejam que tem um Dalton de diferença para cada uma dessas, desses picos aqui. Isso aqui é um espectro de MS, tá? É, vejam que é um Dalton de diferença. Isso aqui são os isótopos de carbono. Quando eu tenho essa distribuição clássica que eu estou mostrando para vocês, onde os isótopos se comportam como se fosse uma escadinha na proporção de cada um deles, eu sei que na minha molécula só tem carbono, hidrogênio e oxigênio. Então, a distribuição isotópica me informa que átomos estão compondo aquela molécula. Tá? Quando eu tenho, por exemplo, cloro na molécula, eu tenho uma distribuição isotópica característica da presença de cloro. Se eu tenho bromo se eu tenho enxofre, se eu tenho boro e assim por diante. Então, a distribuição isotópica, ela fornece para vocês a informação de que átomos compõem aquela molécula. Aí vocês vão perguntar para mim, tá, Xavier, mas eu vou ter que ver isso? Ah, não, existem ferramentas de software que vão olhar para a distribuição isotópica e vão dizer, olha, nessa distribuição isotópica é, existe cloro nessa, nessa estrutura molecular, existe bromo, existe enxofre. Então, quando vocês estão fazendo a análise de um produto é, desconhecido, por exemplo, a distribuição isotópica vai dizer para vocês, olha, dá uma olhada com carinho se essa molécula não tem cloro na estrutura dela. Então, vai ajudando vocês nessa descoberta dessa nova molécula. Tá? E o analisador de massa propriamente dito, que é o sistema que o TOF, apenas para vocês entenderem, o TOF, né, a sigla TOF vem de Time of Flight, ou tempo de voo, né? Ele é, um, ele é um tubo por onde voam as moléculas, e moléculas mais leves tocam o detector antes das moléculas mais pesadas. Então, as moléculas elas são diferenciadas entre si pelo tempo de voo dentro de um tubo de alto vácuo, tá? Isso é o TOF. E quando a gente fala em QTOF, 
Aí é um sistema híbrido, onde eu tenho esse tubo de voo capaz de detectar moléculas com alta resolução e alta exatidão de massa, só que precedendo esse tubo de voo, eu tenho uma região chamada de quadropolo 1 e célula de colisão, onde eu consigo filtrar minhas moléculas baseadas em sua massa e fragmentá-las, caso eu queira fragmentá-las. Se eu não quiser fragmentar, eu tenho a detecção dessa molécula intacta. Então, quando eu jogo, por exemplo, se eu estou trabalhando com uma análise target, eu digo, olha, eu quero procurar a molécula de massa 500 ali na minha amostra. Quando todas aquelas moléculas chegam no meu primeiro quadropolo, só a molécula de massa 500 passa. E eu posso fragmentar ela e detectar os fragmentos dela com alta resolução e alta exatidão. Ou então eu posso dizer, sistema, eu não quero fragmentar essa molécula de massa 500. A célula de colisão ela é desligada e a molécula de massa, de massa 500, nesse exemplo que eu estou falando, passa aqui e é detectada inteira, com alta resolução e alta exatidão. Então essa é a característica do hardware de um sistema QTOF, tá? Então, aquilo que eu falei, um sistema QTOF ele pode fazer com que vocês detectem a molécula intacta, aqui eu tenho um espectro de uma molécula de massa 202.08584, e também o perfil de fragmentação dessa molécula. E eu consigo pedir para o meu QTOF obter essas duas informações é, simultaneamente. Então, eu posso, é, injetando a mesma amostra, ele vai me dar a informação dessa molécula intacta e da informação dessa molécula fragmentada. Lembrando para vocês que essas informações da molécula intacta e da molécula fragmentada são... É, valiosíssimas quando eu estou trabalhando numa abordagem de descoberta de novos compostos ou de identificação de um composto específico, de um composto específico tá? Aqui eu mostro para vocês quais são, os, aqui no caso, as ferramentas de software que levam a uma identificação de uma molécula, tá? Então, os critérios que o um LCQ TOF utiliza para a identificação de uma molécula. Então, nós levamos em consideração aqui a massa uh, da minha... Da minha Nesse caso aqui, a metadona, né? Uma molécula, ela tem a massa 309.296. Essa, é essa é a massa medida durante o meu experimento. Eu tenho a diferença de massa aqui em PPM, que é aquela exatidão de massas que eu falei para vocês. E eu tenho, então, um score de quantos por cento essa molécula que eu estou medindo, que eu estou analisando na minha amostra, levando em consideração a exatidão de massa medida comparada com a exatidão de massa teórica, mais a distribuição isotópica desse composto na minha amostra, mais o perfil de fragmentação dela, eu, isso tudo vai ser levado em consideração. Também o tempo de retenção. Todos esses critérios, no final, ele vai dizer para mim, olha, com no, nesse caso aqui, né? Com 99,56% de certeza, a molécula que você está medindo na sua amostra é a metadona, tá? Nesse caso, desse exemplo aqui. Então, isso se aplica... Imaginem que vocês estão fazendo aquela análise que o professor Lohan citou daquelas, daqueles compostos. Você tem um banco de dados com aqueles compostos. Você joga uma amostra e aparece aquele composto na amostra. O sistema que eu tô, ele vai jogar isso contra o banco de dados, vai considerar todos esses critérios para que vocês não fiquem é, achando que estão identificando o composto X e é o composto Y, por exemplo. Então, esses critérios são importantes para evitar resultados falsos positivos, tá? E outra, cara, e outra ferramenta muito importante quando a gente está trabalhando com sistemas lcq tof é a capacidade de gerar fórmula molecular e descobrir compostos desconhecidos. Nesse exemplo aqui, uma molécula de massa 285.02044 foi identificada na amostra. Primeira coisa que o sistema vai fazer é gerar possíveis fórmulas moleculares para essa massa medida. Tá? É bom dizer que isso aí é uma... Um, um terpeno lá dentro da, do, 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 da folha, lá de uma amostra que eu estou analisando. Primeira coisa, eu vou usar uma ferramenta chamada Molecular Formula Generator, que vai gerar possíveis fórmulas moleculares. Depois o software vai levar em consideração a distribuição isotópica desse composto, dessa massa aqui, vai levar em consideração o perfil de fragmentação, e ao final ele vai dizer, olha, baseado nos critérios de distribuição isotópica, de massa exata e de fragmentação, com 98% de certeza, para essa massa que foi medida, 285.02044, a fórmula molecular é a C11H14ClNO3. Então, vocês já começam a ter a primeira informação de que composto é esse que eu estou analisando. 
tá? Então, a fórmula molecular, vocês podem usar duas, duas alternativas. Vocês podem jogar essa fórmula molecular, por exemplo, num banco de dados público, como o ChemSpider, e o ChemSpider vai trazer para vocês todas as estruturas cadastradas né, nesse banco de dados que podem ser atribuídas a essa fórmula molecular gerada a partir da massa exata medida de um composto desconhecido, tá? Vocês podem usar uma ferramenta aqui, no caso do... Eh, vocês estão vendo que eu não sou muito comercial na minha apresentação, eu poucas vezes falo da, o nome da empresa que eu trabalho, na Agilent, né? Mas a ferramenta da Agilent, que é utilizada para essa, essa elucidação, chama Molecular Structure Correlator. Então, vocês vão poder pegar uma estrutura molecular proposta por esse banco de dados, ou vocês vão poder desenhar essa estrutura molecular numa ferramenta, por exemplo, ponto mol, num programa ponto mol, vocês desenham essa estrutura e é assim que vocês vão trabalhar. Vocês têm aqui a fragmentação obtida experimentalmente e a estrutura proposta, seja proposta por vocês, vocês desenhar, vocês não trabalham, vocês estão pesquisando um flavonoide. Vocês sabem que o flavonoide já tem uma estrutura básica que é característica dele, ou então um esteroide, ou então um terpeno. Vocês podem propor essa estrutura essa ferramenta Molecular Structure Correlator, ela vai fragmentar essa estrutura proposta e vai comparar a fragmentação obtida teoricamente, nessa estrutura que vocês estão propondo, com a fragmentação obtida experimentalmente. E é isso que vocês vão ter. Se, as fra... Se os fragmentos obtidos teoricamente aqui da estrutura proposta baterem com os fragmentos obtidos experimentalmente, vocês têm, então, a elucidação estrutural de um composto desconhecido. Vocês podem patentear, vocês podem né, depois estudar o efeito biológico dele, a atividade biológica ou a toxicidade desse composto e assim por diante. Mas, basicamente, e lembrando, né, pessoal, isso aqui é uma apresentação de 40 minutos. Eu estou colocando para vocês a ponta do iceberg. Obviamente que essas, essas ferramentas elas têm muito mais recursos a serem apresentados, mas pelo adiantado da hora, né, a gente tá, eu estou só passando para vocês uma, uma, uma visão bem genérica de, tudo, de todas essas ferramentas, tá? Outra, outro tipo de ferramenta de software bem importante para vocês que trabalham com análise de produtos naturais são as, as ferramentas estatísticas, né? Que vai possibilitar para vocês uh, realmente ver as relevâncias uh, estatísticas daquilo que vocês estão procurando. As diferenças entre amostras uh, e a... Tudo, tudo, bom, vocês trabalham e publicam artigos constantemente. Vocês sabem o quanto que a, 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 a parte estatística do artigo pesa nas, na, nas conclusões né? e no impacto, né? no peso do trabalho que vocês estão realizando. Aqui só mostrando um exemplo de uma ferramenta estatística, que é o PCA, que é o Principal Compound Analysis, né? que é a análise de compostos principais, que está dentro de uma ferramenta estatística que a gente também fornece com seus sistemas QTOPS, que é o Mass Profile Professional, ou MPP. Aqui é só um exemplo ó, de análise de cebola, diferentes tipos de cebola sendo diferenciadas entre si através da presença dos flavonoides presentes nela. Então, com o LCQTOF, nesse exemplo, se pegou diversos tipos de cebola e os flavonoides presentes em cada uma delas agrupam elas em diferentes regiões desse gráfico 3D. Então, por exemplo, vocês conseguem, ah, digamos que vocês estão analisando um... um, um sei lá, uma amostra de... Eu falei antes de folha de caju, vou continuar na folha de caju. Vocês estão analisando ali alguns, uh, algum ativo, alguma substância bioativa naquela folha. Vocês querem saber, por exemplo, uh, se essas folhas que estão vindo para vocês, estão vindo do Nordeste, estão vindo do Norte do Brasil, estão vindo do Centro-Oeste, vocês conseguem diferenciar a origem dessas folhas a partir das massas expressas nela, que são medidas, então, com alta resolução e alta exatidão, tá? E alguns exemplos de LC que o TOF para análise de produtos naturais. Aqui finalizando, então, a apresentação com alguns exemplos práticos de todas essas ferramentas e todas essas características que eu apresentei para vocês. Eu trouxe aqui alguns artigos científicos. Todos esses exemplos que eu vou passar para vocês são exemplos, é, são artigos gerados utilizando os sistemas LC que o TOF da Agilent, diferentes modelos, tá? Por questões éticas, eu não posso trazer aqui... É, é, sistemas que o TOFs de outras marcas, né? Então, por questões éticas e de, de compromisso meu com a empresa na qual eu trabalho, eu, te, eu trago para vocês aqui e tudo que vocês vão ver agora daqui para frente foram obtidas com sistemas Agilent, LC que o TOF Agilent. Então, aqui um primeiro trabalho, análise de ginseng, tá? Extrato de ginseng. Então, obviamente, também eu vou trazer apenas highlights dos trabalhos, os trabalhos são muito mais complexos e extensos do que eu vou mostrar aqui, mas só para vocês terem uma noção do uso das ferramentas. Então, esse primeiro trabalho aqui, uma análise de ginseng. Então, 
foi possível, nesse trabalho, identificar um composto desconhecido dentro do ginseng. Então, aqui se gerou todas aquelas fórmulas moleculares baseadas na massa exata medida. A massa exata medida é essa aqui de baixo, 1195.6109. Então, isso era um composto que ninguém tinha catalogado ainda no ginseng. Então, foi possível, através da massa exata, através do perfil de fragmentação e o uso daquela ferramenta Molecular Structure Correlator, foi possível identificar um composto novo dentro do ginseng nesse trabalho. Além disso, nesse mesmo trabalho, foi possível também identificar um composto conhecido, o pseudo ginsencosid, né, de massa 800.4940. Então, esse composto foi identificado dentro dessa amostra de ginseng e também foi possível comparar a quantidade desse composto em amostras da Ásia e em amostras das Américas, tá? Mostrando aqui que nas amostras americanas, a, a concentração desse composto é o dobro do que aquele presente nas amostras... É, é, nesse caso aqui, asiáticas, tá? Então, é possível fazer isso que eu falei para vocês, identificar o composto e comparar com diferentes uh, origens, seja america, aqui nesse caso, americana ou asiática, tá? Um outro estudo que eu achei bem interessante foi a, 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 a avaliação de algumas plantas com o crescimento de fungos de armazenagem, aqui que geram aquelas micotoxinas e tudo mais, que trazem problemas de saúde e problemas também econômicos por causa da do comércio de grãos e tudo mais pelo mundo, né? Então, esse aqui foi um estudo feito com duas plantas, tá? A ferula comunis e a dietrichia viscosa, ou dietrichia viscosa, tá? Esses compostos, eles têm algumas, algumas é, propriedades antifúngicas e nesse estudo, justamente, se fe... foi feito o quê? A identificação dos compostos, nesse caso aqui da tabela da esquerda, os compostos presentes, ou os compostos majoritários presentes na ditrícia viscosa, tá? Baseados aqui nas suas massas, tudo isso feito com espectrometria de massas, tá? E aqui do lado direito, os compostos presentes na ferula comunis, tá? E depois se fez uma, uma análise aqui no, na, na tabela de baixo, uma análise da capacidade dessas plantas em inibir o crescimento desses fungos, seja o crescimento das colônias, aqui no caso M, né? Ou no crescimento do, da, na germinação dos conídeos, tá? No caso do C. Então, aqui, a, tanto a de triste quanto a ferula, aqui no caso a ferula tem duas amostras, porque uma é da raiz e a outra é das partes aéreas, mostrando a capacidade delas em inibir o crescimento e a, 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 a germinação conidial. Então, isso é uma aplicação do uso de análise de a, produtos naturais nesse caso específico, para avaliar o seu efeito uh, antifúngico, para o uso de fungicidas naturais, né? tentando utilizar essas plantas como fungicidas naturais. Aqui um trabalho que eu achei muito legal, um trabalho uh, realizado na, do, no, no Departamento de Engenharia Biomédica e de, uh, Aeroespacial e Mecânica, uh, lá do, de uma universidade do Tennessee, é, aqui eles fizeram uma análise das partes, das, das partes aéreas da Ivy, que é a era, né? Uma planta, e eles avaliaram as nanopartículas que são responsáveis por, essa, por essas raízes conseguirem se aderir, né? Porque são raízes que vão, são trepadeiras, né? Usando aqui uma, 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 uma expressão um pouco mais é, comum. Então, esse estudo buscou avaliar que nanopartículas estão presentes nessas raízes que fazem com que essa, essa planta se adeira, consiga se aderir com tanta eficiência em determinadas superfícies. Então, foram identificados 19 compostos relacionados com essa capacidade de adesão e o objetivo desse estudo é justamente identificar, uh, elucidar essas estruturas e utilizar elas em tecnologias aeroespaciais e outros tipos de engenharia, né? Outras, uh, e várias aplica aplicações de engenharia. Então, achei esse trabalho extremamente interessante, tá? Um outro trabalho que eu trouxe para vocês é a caracterização de flavonoides anti antioxidantes nesse composto aqui na Tragia involucrata, que é, um, que é uma, uma planta utilizada uh, na medicina e foi, então, feito diversas frações dessa planta, onde a gente vê com destaque a fração B3 e a fração B4, que mostraram uma alta capacidade de, de, de efeito antioxidante e utilizaram esse DPPH como radical uh, livre para análise dessa, desse efeito antioxidante in vitro. Né? Então, assim, esse trabalho avaliou essas frações que são eficientes no, na, na, no, na, na, na ação antioxidante e qual foi a proposta do trabalho. No caso aqui, a fração B3 
e a fração B4 estão aqui divididas em cima, a fração B3 e aqui a fração B4, e justamente identificar os picos presentes em cada uma delas e a identificação desses compostos, para se saber quais são esses compostos presentes nessas frações que têm esse efeito antioxidante. Então, uma, uma identificação estrutural de compostos que tenham esse efeito antioxidante, uma, uma elucidação estrutural e uma identificação de compostos desconhecidos nesse caso. Aí aqui eu tenho vários, vários, vários trabalhos, aí eu não posso, não tem como detalhar todos, porque a gente tem mais uh, dois minutos aqui de apresentação, mas eu trouxe só para vocês citarem como essas apresentações elas vão ficar disponíveis para vocês, vocês podem buscar também essas referências que estão aqui, e se quiserem daí se aprofundar mais em cada um desses estudos que eu estou citando, vocês fiquem à vontade, tá? Então aqui nós temos estudo de, uh, de, de varredura de, antioxid de antioxidantes naturais em uma determinada... Uh, de uma determinada planta, um estudo realizado numa, na, na China, né? Aqui, quantificação de lipídios esteroides em algumas plantas, é, um estudo conduzido na Alemanha, então, também mostrando que o sistema que o TOF é capaz de quantificar, né? Dizer quanto que tem daquele composto. É, com, identificação de compostos fenólicos por abordagem não target, aqui em, uma, em, um, em um, um estudo realizado também na Índia, mostrando a capacidade daquela abordagem não-alvo, que eu falei para vocês, que é a busca de tudo que está dentro daquela amostra que está sendo estudada. Né? Algumas outras, alguns outros, é, alguns outros estudos aqui, um estudo realizado também na China, comparando o processamento de algumas plantas de, de, da, da medicina tradicional indiana e chinesa, né, mostrando se a, a eficiência desse processamento para aquisição ou para presença de compostos ativos no medicamento final. É, compostos, esse aqui eu achei bem interessante, é, análise do fluido oral de ratos é, e também do plasma após a administração de extratos de bambu extraídos com água quente. Então, aquilo que o rato, o que foi, desculpa, o rato não, o, 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 o coelho, recebeu aquela água quente que foi utilizada para extrair compostos do bambu e foi avaliado no que, que ele biotransformou aqueles compostos ativos. Achei bem interessante. Análise de, de, de inib... uh, flavonoides inibidores da aldose redutase em algumas formulações uh, de, de erva, né, de plantas. Aqui, um outro trabalho uh, realizado também, uh, se não me engano, esse aqui também é na China, é... Ao, na, desculpa, na Índia, esse foi um trabalho uh, para análise de extratos para tratamento de psorias, achei bem interessante esse trabalho, e uh, uh, uma análise de constituintes da raiz da, da, do jasmim. Então, isso aqui traz para vocês uma visão geral uh, de, do potencial do uso de um QTOF dentro do laboratório, eu trouxe para vocês as características básicas desse sistema, mais uma vez, extremamente básica, extremamente superficial, mas para dar para vocês... Uh, uma noção de que muito desses trabalhos que vocês estão vendo sendo apresentado durante o evento aqui, é, e eu destaco o trabalho que foi apresentado antes do meu, né, a apresentação foi feita antes da minha, pelo professor Lohan, uh, o quão importante é uma etapa de análise por LCMS em amostras de, de produtos naturais. Eu deixo aqui, então, o meu e-mail, caso vocês tenham alguma dúvida, e, mais uma vez, eu gostaria de agradecer a, a, o convite uh, para nós participarmos do evento. Professor... Cravou os 40 minutos aqui no meu, no meu cronômetro. Terminei a apresentação, fico aberto e disponível para perguntas. Obrigado, Xavier. Realmente um professor aí, né? A didática muito boa, atenta ao tempo da aula. Muito bom mesmo. E o conteúdo também excelente, né? Deu para revisar aqui muita coisa. É, várias perguntas que os alunos fazem na sala de aula, né? Então, é, a gente revisou bem aqui o assunto. Tem uma pergunta aqui da Márcia, deixa eu colocar aqui para você. Essa é outra que o pessoal sempre me faz e agora é a hora de passar para vocês aí, né? Ontem eu passei para o Celso. Muito boa pergunta. É, muito Ó, interessante a pergunta dela. Muito, muito boa pergunta e às vezes a pessoa... Às vezes a, a, justamente a dúvida é assim, se é a mesma coisa, para que usar um cromatógrafo líquido, né? Então, basicamente, é, Márcia, a diferença é o seguinte. Quando eu trabalho com um cromatógrafo líquido acoplado ao massas, eu tenho a separação cromatográfica em uma coluna. Então, cada composto vai chegar no espectro de massas num determinado tempo. Essa retenção, esse tempo, me dá uma, uma informação da polaridade desse composto. Por exemplo, se eu tenho uma coluna de fase apolar 
e esse composto demora mais para sair da coluna seguinte, significa que esse, esse composto tem muita afinidade para essa coluna. Então, ele também é apolar, ou mais apolar que os outros que saíram antes. Essa é a primeira, é a primeira vantagem do LC, acoplado ao massas. Segunda coisa, existe um fenômeno chamado supressão iônica, que ocorre nas fontes de ionização do tipo eletrospray. Se muita coisa chega ao meio... para ser analisado, às vezes aquele meu composto que está em menor quantidade... Professor, me ouve? Estou ouvindo, estou ouvindo. Professor Jackson? Oi, estou ouvindo. Estou ouvindo, é que deu um, deu um parou aqui a, a imagem, Isso, achei que é. tinha caído na internet. Então, assim, quando eu faço por infusão, todo mundo está chegando o tempo todo no Massas. Se eu tenho muita molécula chegando ao mesmo tempo no Massas... Se eu tenho uma molécula de interesse numa concentração muito baixa, a hora que ela vai pegar a carga para ser ionizada, para ser analisada, outra, uma molécula de interferente pega a carga antes e ela fica neutra. E aí, se ela fica neutra, ela não pode ser analisada no espectrômetro de massa. Então, essas são as grandes diferenças. Os pontos negativos de uma análise por infusão é o risco da supressão iônica e a minha incapacidade de ter separação cromatográfica e picos cromatográficos integráveis para ser quantificado. A minha vantagem... E a minha... E a, e a minha a vantagem quando eu trabalho com a cromatografia líquida é ter justamente essa separação, cada molécula no seu tempo de retenção e, e todas elas com o melhor sinal possível pelo processo de supressão iônica ter sido uh, minimizado. Espero ter respondido. Tranquilo. Acho que é isso mesmo, né? A, a infusão direta, ela dá uma informação, né? Se você tem aquele íon de interesse, o composto, né? Que aí você vai utilizar o método cromatográfico para poder separar né, e fazer aí a obtenção do espectro de massas, que aí dá para fazer modo positivo, modo negativo, né, no caso aí, ionização por eletrospray, então realmente é, são técnicas que podem se ajudar, né, podem conversar. Né, só... é, no, 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 normalmente a infusão é algo que a gente quer uma resposta rápida, que eu não tenho Isso. que montar coluna, porque às vezes o que, que acontece? Ah, eu quero achar, por exemplo, um, um terpeno ali na minha amostra, e eu estou usando a coluna, e nunca aparece aquele terpeno, porque está ficando retido na coluna, então eu faço uma infusão para ver se ele realmente está na minha amostra. Ele está na minha amostra? Eu vou trabalhar a minha cromatografia para arrancar ele dentro da coluna. Daí. Pronto, aí está o um comentário da Márcia também, né? maravilha, obrigada. Ela está perguntando aqui se as palestras vão ficar salvas, vão ficar, Márcia, então o pessoal autorizou aqui a publicação, né? Então vai estar tá no site da TV Catinga, no YouTube, né? no canal do YouTube, então... A partir de amanhã, vocês já podem acessar aí, tá certo? E quem tiver mais alguma pergunta, ainda temos um minutinho para a gente encerrar. E mais uma vez, a gente lembra né, que amanhã as atividades começam às 13 horas, tá certo? Então, 13 horas em ponto, a gente começa as palestras para a gente encerrar e fechar o evento com chave de ouro. Bom, então acho que não tem nenhuma pergunta aqui, Xavier, acho que foi bastante esclarecedora a apresentação, né? o pessoal é, já está aqui satisfeito né, com, com o que foi mostrado, e mais uma vez, em nome da comissão organizadora, a gente agradece né, a você, ao Rodrigo, à Agile, a né, empresa Agile, tá certo? Pronto, Márcia colocou mais um aqui, vamos fazer aqui a última rodada. Vamos lá. Pronto, aqui. Perguntando sobre é, a diferença abordagem de aquisição. É, deixa eu tentar entender. PRM, DDA e BDI. É, talvez são siglas de marcas específicas, mas eu entendo que seja MRM, DDA, que é a dependent, é, é, análise de dados dependentes, e a DDI, análise de dados independentes. Se há diferença na relação ao sinal ruído ou detecção do íon. Sim. Quando a gente trabalha com MRM, que eu acredito que esse PRM seria o MRM, eu trabalho focado em cima de uma molécula que me interessa. Então, meu espectrômetro de massas só vai estar olhando para aquilo ali. Então, o meu sinal, ele, ele, eu beneficio a detecção dessa molécula, a minha relação sinal ruído fica melhor e, 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 consequentemente, a minha detecção é mais sensível, porque eu estou trabalhando focado. Quando eu trabalho com DDA ou DDI, que são os dados, por exemplo, eu estou fazendo uma análise... E eu digo para o meu instrumento, ah, se aquela molécula ultrapassar um determinado sinal, eu quero que o meu sistema chaveie e comece a fragmentar. Quando eu trabalho assim, há sim perda de sinal, viu, Márcia? Ah, ou melhor, não diria perda de sinal, mas uma diminuição da sensibilidade, porque o meu instrumento está tendo que fazer várias abordagens ao mesmo tempo. 
porém, a minha informação é, é, ela é menos sensível, mas ela é mais rica em termos de informação para identificar ou para elucidar aquele composto. São abordagens que se complementam e que, sim, têm vantagens e desvantagens entre elas, tá? A diferença na relação se está um ruído ou detecção do íon, sim. Tá? Às vezes, quando eu estou trabalhando, por exemplo, com um DDA, com uma faixa muito ampla de massas que eu estou monitorando, moléculas que estão numa concentração muito baixa podem não chavear e podem não ser detectadas. Então, existem algumas, algumas táticas de criar janelas de faixa de massas menores para que eu consiga cobrir todo mundo numa, numa, numa amostra ali. Okay? Bom, tranquilo. Acho que é, a gente já pode encerrar as atividades do dia. Né? E amanhã a gente se encontra novamente a partir das 13 horas divulguem aí para o pessoal, para os colegas, né, para a gente fechar amanhã o evento com a boa participação dos nossos internautas. Tá bom? Então, é, Xavier, até a próxima. Espero que em 2023 a gente se encontre aqui mais uma vez presencialmente, né? E se Deus quiser, essa situação toda vai se normalizar, tudo vai passar e a gente vai voltar aí à nossa vida ao normal. Tá bom? Amém. Então, boa noite a todos e até amanhã no quarto dia do oitavo Flamengo Vasco.